And I'm going to, for everybody's information on the board, there is this little map on here that is from 20 League from Indiana Political. Uh, we had spoke about a week and a half or yeah, and I kind of forgot to put it on there. So if we could discuss what he's kind of looking at for a sewer issue that he's having, um, but there would be no motion for anything made for it. What it is, but I think it'd be good to hear the discussion that he has, and then also be able to maybe can you can make a recommendation or kind of give a idea of what you guys are thinking on what you recommend. But that would be added to the bottom of the. Yep. Okay. So we're gonna start with new business tonight. Um, the first is Baltic Heights fence variance at 522 David Avenue. Um, Kieran, what are you trying to? We got, I got the picture here of what you're trying to do. What are you asking for exactly? On the east side of the property. I'm sorry, I know you no disrespect, but I had cataracts. No, no, that's fine. No, no. These lights are killing me. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Is there an attachment I can put on the screen for everybody? Let me find it. That's very right? Yep. Yes, got it. Okay. So I'm going to have my bride talk to you. Okay. Well, initially we were told it had to be 10 feet of the property line. But we're on a corner lot, so I guess there's an issue with, you know, the two sides, snow, piling up the snow and such. But initially it's supposed to be, you know, 10 feet from the property line. Um, but we're asking for one foot from the property line because that is our backyard. And then you folks, you're familiar with the 12 02? It says additional use regulation. Okay. Okay. So this one says within the area from the curb line to 10 feet behind the curb line. And you already have 11 feet on the boulevard. There's four feet of sidewalk. And so we're asking for an additional one feet foot from the property line. Okay, so that deal that you're referencing, um, so the one that you're referencing there for section 12. That's that's the lot there. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Where the trash can is, that's the side that we're wanting to go one foot to the west of the of the sidewalk. If you look where they have a kind of there's a postal postal, there's a uh Rebar, rebar space right there. It's kind of okay. So, so we're going out the edge of the garage. Yep. So, so in front of the house is the side of the house. Yep. Well, technically, it's still frontage property. So, but it's our backyard. Well, no, it's still considered frontage property because it's on street. You would only have to have a twenty foot setback on that side. Though. So the reference that you're referring to as in section twelve, uh -huh. that is for visibility, not where you can place your fence. That is just for the visibility for people to see around corners. But you it have to go. Fence there, yes, it refers to fence there, but section 12.8 or 08 is for fences. And that's where the regulations fall in for your fencing, um, where it says no barbed wire shall be erected, um, no fence shall be erected, and maintained in a manner unreasonable obstructive view of others and their access to light or air. That view part refers back to the fences in the view for the corners and stuff. But we're, um, we're at least 40 feet back from the, from the stop sign. Yep, there. yep. So, and that's you're right there. So, then when you go down on um, section D, says <coughs> double frontage and corner lots used residentially. Fences not more than six feet in height may be placed in the required front yard of abutting in arterial or correctional street where. The required is not used as a front yard. The fence is set back minimum of 10 feet from the property line, abrupting the arterial or collector street. So that's where the 10 foot comes into play. And then. So why is the 10 foot needed? That's taking 10 feet from the property owner's yard. So then in section C for all residential areas, um, It says fences not more than six feet in height may be erected on any part of a lot other than in the required 
front yard fences may not be more than three feet in height, may be located on any on any part of the lot. Fences along the perimeter of a front yard shall be of decorative type only, such as picket or split rail. <clears throat> so your lot on the frontage fields, they're both considered front yards because the house could have faced either direction. The difference on the corner is you only got to have a 20 foot setback on the one, but it's still considered a frontage lot. Why? So you fall into the no more than three feet high, so that'd be a picket or split rail fence, and it's got to be 10 foot from the property. So, so yours says that you want to put a four foot chain link fence one foot from the lot line. Correct. So it's it can't be a chain link fence. It has to be a split rail um, picket or something like that. So it can't be chain link. Um, it's got to be 10 foot from the property line and it can only be three feet tall there. Okay, so using your directions, I'm, I am gonna be six feet from the corner of my house there and 10 feet will be outside my fence. Yep. But why is it 10 feet? Why was that ordinance going to effect? I didn't make the ordinances. It's, I did, these ordinances have been here since 2010. Okay, and that's why we're asking so, for a variance from it. Yep. If you could, you know, now that you've seen. So you're, you're asking for multiple variances there in theory, because you're asking to put it closer. You're asking to put a different type of fence in than what's required. And height. Height. Also, so you're actually trying to get three variances for a fence. You're correct. I apologize. I no. did not know that that was, even though it's my backyard, I didn't know that was considered yep. a front yard. And that's underneath the lot's description. Um, I can't, no, I, don't, I, I, I don't remember I, which page it's on in there, but it's, um, that's where it says with the, that's why you're required to have a 20 foot setback there is because it's still considered a frontage all the way from lot line to lot line. So, um, Example, um, there's a couple houses on um, um, Douglas where their fence is back just like that, and they got that big wide area alongside because they got double frontage also. Yeah, we tried, we drove around town, we couldn't find anybody that it's closer than I that. must have missed that one. Well, so it's actually Nate's house, is one of them. He's actually on a here, Nate, with the planning and zoning. He's actually got a corner frontage lot where he had to keep his fence in off that 10 foot setback. So, um, here's a couple of things that I'm going to say because when, and I, I can't speak for the last four years because I was not here, but prior to it, we kind of went through one of the things is it, it's on a residential street. Uh, main part is, is if we have to do something in that right away you're going to be working on the streets more than in someone's backyard or anything like that uh snow removal is one of the key factors is when we if we're going to get a lot of snow any year and this year is predicted that we are we might at times have to push snow off of the street and onto the boulevards um that would limit us and that's limit us from pushing it on we don't want to try to get it on people's property but we want to use maximize what we can on the boulevards. And at times we've actually had people to told them that they no longer have to scoop the snow on their sidewalks because we are literally pushing snow on there. And that's, it's been years since we've had to do that. I know mm -hmm. the worst was up in the Baltic Heights, the older part of the development, because it was just, you had wide in the streets because there wasn't enough room for traffic to even drive down. Uh, with that, with those last four years, I don't know, but we stuck to that ordinance just because it is one of the kind of the site visibility plus that needing that utility area to pile snow and if in the future the community would grow where that street would have to be widened at that spot you know all of a sudden then you're really short shortening up your boulevard but then you're also really shortening up your uh property to that fence that side off would be tight another thing i see as there is it, you can't say it's not going to happen but you're on the bottom of a hill I know kids like to ride their bikes and stuff down the sidewalks. One thing would be is that's right next to that sidewalk. I mean, for if someone would 
right into that by accident. It wasn't probably intentional, but it is kind of a safety thing right there that I can see happening since it is so close to a sidewalk that will be used by pedestrians. Um, so those are kind of the things that I look at when I'm looking at different parts of the town. But one thing is, is we had it set for a lot of years. We've actually had people move fences. There's one, if you are up on 6th Street on the north side of Baltic Heights, there will be a chain link fence that stops and there's no corner post. It was in violation probably 15 years ago and it was removed from that part of that, that 20 foot right of way because, or that 20 foot side yard because it was not in compliance with the ordinance at that point. Okay, so any other points? Uh, we'll put it to a vote with the council. Um, anybody in favor of granting a variance for the fence at 522 David Avenue? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I need a motion to approve the variance for 522 David Avenue. Approved or denied. Are there any other questions for you guys? Or you guys have any questions? Nope. Before you do that, I do have one other question just came up. If I put that in the middle of my yard, does it still have to be split rail or three feet? The way this reads, as long as you're 10 feet from the property line, you can put it four feet. Your chain link fence four feet tall. That would be okay. The way this is read, yes. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion to deny or approve the variance? Are you asking to change your request? No, I don't mean to be. I'm looking at 12.08C, since it's not more than three feet in height being located on any part of it. So how can it be four feet? I'm just so reading I think on D, John, it says on double front and okay. front of yes. okay. Yeah. Not yes. more than six feet in right. that maybe. Right. Got it. It's more specific, so that would control. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Unless this ordinance can be changed in the future, I make a motion to deny the variance. All those in favor of denial? Yeah. Second. Or second for the denial? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, motion denied for the variance. All those opposed? All those opposed? Okay. Um, the uh, variance for the fence at 522 is denied. We could, um, we don't have to make a motion to do that. So we, as an action item, we can look into the ordinance for the future to see if we want to change that in any way to. Uh, um, just pull the road blank there. Sorry about that. Um, to better either explain the reasoning or if we need to change it a little bit. I didn't want to create an argument or a debate before the acceptance or denial, but I plow the streets in Sioux Falls. Sorry, Ryan, no offense. Um, I used to live in a house that had a wooden fence that was four foot in height, two feet off of the sidewalk on a corner lot. That's the ordinance in Sioux Falls. Yep. Never had an issue with pedestrians or with plowing. And I, I even went over and plowed to push it back farther. Um, I really, really believe we should relook into this so people can look into changing it if they want to or moving forward with that. And that so, and that will be the action item to look at. Yeah. That. So, what other communities are doing that are <clears throat> all right? Let's move on to 
Um, Baltic or original review of four street plots, um, old south trailer court. Um, I didn't see a paper for that. In here it is. Okay, so um, is what that is is Mark Tomerson, um needs to get his plot approved for replotting that trailer court into four multi-unit zone um, lots for multi-family. Um, <clears throat> he brought it before us before, and <clears throat> we required that they make the road the proper width. He did that with his plotting. He redid it so that the road is the 66 foot right away now. Um, so we need a motion to pass this on to city council for approval. So essentially just, I don't, I don't know how, what term to use, but gave back per se, is that the term so here? In to the, accommodate for that? Okay, so, so in the subdivision ordinances, which since this is replotting, it does fall under subdivision ordinances. It says that if any right away is not the proper width, that the city can make them allocate the property to do the proper width. Okay. Um, found that just recently here to gotcha. firm that up. But so basically, originally the road right away was in the center of the lots. They moved it to the edge of the lots, vacated it, so the, that became part of the property. But at that time, they didn't make the road the proper width for the 66 foot right away. So this just basically. Move the property lot pin seven feet roughly back to the east to make the road the proper width. And all the lots meet the depth requirement of 100 foot. They all meet the 66 foot and the 7,500 square foot minimum requirements. So we need a motion to either accept the plot to pass it to city council for final approval or denial. So everything meets requirements? Yes, it does. And make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Flat approved to go to city council. Next is the Langness edition, Donovan Van and Von Holcomb property line dispute. Um, I don't know who's if both parties are here. No, just me. Just you, and you are Jeff Von Holton. Von Holton. Okay. We do have the phone number of the other lady if you need to call her. Okay. For questions. Okay. Yeah, right here, Sandra. Yeah. Okay. So you moved in June seventh of this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is to an extent. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Nathan is asking if it's a civil, civil suit. Boundary line disputes typically are civil matters between the property owners that have the boundary line dispute. Um, if the city owned the property in which those boundary line dispute, that would be a different issue. But generally speaking, the city doesn't have any authority to change property lines. What about South Dakota codified law 1174? Well, if you want to, do you have a copy of that with you? I'm not sure, take a look at it. It basically, from what I understand, gives planning and zoning of the city the right to, uh, or the responsibility of property lines and to enforce them. This is also the same information I got from the county when I was told to go there. If you had a survey done. I didn't have a survey done, but Donovan did. Luckily, from the same guy I know, and uh, 
he won't let them place or they won't pay him to place the last pin. What usually happens when property is, when boundaries are adjusted, is a, a registered land surveyor comes out and does a survey. I can't do that though because they haven't paid him. So he tells me he's legally contracted. He can't, I can't hire him until he either gets rid of their bill somehow or they pay him. Well, you can hire another surveyor. Good. Well, I'm, I'm sure I get that four or five hundred well, yeah. back out. Now. Well, I don't two. know, but the, the only way that you can change a boundary line is if the two yeah. owners of the property would agree to have a replat with a boundary line change. First off, you need a survey to find out where the. Wait, that's where I'm just waiting. I'll pay the guys. Well, but this, this this body doesn't have the authority to change boundary lines. No, we're not changing it. You could go to court. Well. You they can go to court and adjust. The boundary is correct. Their fence is three foot on my side. Well, that's an encroachment. That's a civil matter. It's not something the city is going to enforce. Because all we can do is make a recommendation to hire. Did you look at it? Well, I, I will look at it now. I'll be happy to. I don't have that particular one, but the first thing that has to be done is it's got to be pinned with the legal land survey, paid, pin set, everything else, and then before we can even look at anything, because- well, I'll give you the advice I got from the uh, city of Sioux Falls and the counties. They said it's- Oh, there is no county or Sioux Falls, but right. you mean me and County? Yeah. It's 1147. I think it's 1174, but it might be 1147. Anyway, they told me it's on their property, just rip it out and have a sheriff there so they can't come. You need to talk to a lawyer and get legal advice on what your options are. I won't listen to the city because they're not a legal they body for starters. So if they, they tell you to do that, you tell them that. Have, or, if you have a power to set a property line, we don't. You we don't. No, we well, don't. Sets the you, you and the adjacent property owner or a judge. So this right here, the flat for okay. this here, he paid. So he bought the property and he's replatting it and putting the lot lines in. Okay, so he brings it to us then and we make sure the distances are correct, the requirements are met. And then we can either deny it for a problem with it, or we can send it to city council for their approval. Okay. So after that, then the city council approves it. Then it's got to get filed with Minnehaha County as a plat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when your lot was made, there would have been a plat filed. Okay. They can look that one. up. And if if there's a problem with it, then you got to get your legal representation to handle it because we don't have nothing to do with who put the fence on what side of the property, right? That's all civil. So you're telling me I could put a fence on his property and you guys can't be sure about it? No, you have no. to get a building permit to do it. You got to get a building permit well, to put the fence on. What about their building permit that let them build something when on they my build property? It? So it was a few years ago. Yeah, and there's probably I don't know if there is anything in there requiring. I know I'm speaking from another community. Colton is they set an ordinance that to put a fence in a long as property line. They require that it be flatted and pinned so that you can have legal verification that you are on your property. Where this was probably no pin. They went best estimate say we've mown this property for all these years. We're going to put a fence here. Still not right. Well, Somebody that's called, has yeah, to, called right or wrong. It's 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 an issue that you have to take care of the legal counsel, not us. I have the same problem. It's not a problem. I have the same situation on my land. My when I bought my house, the neighbor's fence was at least two or three feet on my property, and so. But if I wanted to change that, I would have to engage in a suit to do it, and I have no desire to do that. So it's it's. It's one of the benefits and lovely things about living in a small town. The and city doesn't have adjudicative authority like a court does. And all we can do is just explain that to you. Uh, I have a piece of property with a boundary line dispute. Let me ask this. I mean, if you want to listen to me, can I tell you? I have a, I bought a piece of property last year, and I have a boundary dispute over uh, landscaping. Uh, and the property was owned by a church. And they've now sold it to a private party, and I've taken my survey over. I would never buy property without a survey, but I understand some people do. And uh, they're going to do landscaping uh, modifications, and I've asked them to remove the encroachment that's on my property line. They're going to do it. 
So that's how things get done. Now I could sue the I could sue the property owner, and a judge could say uh, to uh, the neighbor, "You need to move that because that's not on your property. It's encroaching." Right? A judge could do that, but we don't have the power to do that. See, and like in your another, like in your picture here, where you got your tape measure held up against the foundation, there's no guarantee that that there's a picture here with the. Okay, so so somebody sent a picture. Okay, so but like for just for an example, with this picture, if you're measuring off your house, there's no guarantee that your house is exactly where it's supposed to be. That's not even the either. right side of the house. That's the wrong side of the house. This, this might have been sent in by the other party. This might have been sent in by. It was sent by Don. Okay. So, so <clears throat> with experience on doing houses and basements and everything else, you know, they're staked. Concrete guys come in, they pour foundations. They could be off. You know, so I mean. There's probably several houses that aren't technically seven foot from the lot line just due to discrepancies when the concrete's poured from one contractor to the next contractor. Okay. So if you're measuring off your house to say that there are fences on your lot line, your house could be in the wrong spot I'm too. So but no, I'm just I'm just saying, okay. So I understand all that. What would it cost to relocate the fence? I don't know. Well, am I going to do it myself? Well, I'm just split it 50 50. I've rebuilt a fence with my neighbor. Actually, the next thing I'm going to want is a 10 foot variance so I don't have fear to see these people. They called the sheriff on me 20 times since I moved in. Well, we need to move on because. Move on to what? Another town? No, another uh, issue due to the fact that there is no. Lot pin stake or anything, it's a civil matter, so we there's nothing this yeah. council this so we're 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 this stuff. You need to talk to a lawyer and find out what your options are, and I would get an estimate on what it would cost to relocate the fence. And it would probably ought to be a lot less than a lawsuit. Uh, and maybe both you guys can make peace then. I mean, that's what you need to do. It's pretty hard to live next door to somebody. All right. Uh, yeah. Not what I thought. I, mean, I feel bad that the situation is going on. It's not uh, not a good deal. But, uh, it just feels like you guys should have some kind of power to take your responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's that's where the, the legal drawings will come into play. Honestly. All right, we are going to. Go to the um before we get to the Phillips Crossing <coughs> item D in Grant Park, we're gonna take care of Tony Lee here. Um for the sewer, since it's not gonna be nearly as lengthy, probably. Can we address it if it's um, not on the agenda? We is all we can do is look at it and um table it yeah. till the next. Okay, yes. Yes. Okay. Can we address <clears throat> Tony's um well consideration from last time being it's not on the agenda? It's not that I don't want to, not that I don't yeah. we've obviously had conversation before, uh, so it's not new information, but yeah, I just want to make sure that <clears throat> things are falling in order. You want the straight laced answer? It's not on the agenda, it's not a discussion of it. That's why I asked. And you've okay. got a quorum of the council present on top of it. So right. okay. um I yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was looking for some coaching. Well, after the meet, well, as long as there's not a forum presence, right? Up, up to two of you guys could talk to Tony. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. No, 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 you need three. You, you got a three. You don't want a forum, is what you got. Yeah. Fine idea. Okay. Fine idea. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I didn't really come.
take yep. them off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's why. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Okay. That's why we have the return. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Yeah, we're good. We're good. I'm curious what this next one's going to be. All right. So we are going to move on to item B, Phillips Crossing and Grant Park. Erosion control, drainage issues, lot line issues, the whole picture. We have Andy Grocott here from Gooseman Law. Yes, sir. Gooseman and, Law. Uh, Barry Sackett couldn't join us. He had to take care of some affairs, okay. uh, but he's online. Okay, so he's online. Okay. So is it possible that he could uh, speak freely in the meeting as well, or should I get him on the phone? Um, I have to change the settings. The settings. I, I can get them on the phone too. That's, that's, that, that's, that'd be fine. Okay. Barry, I'm going to call you quick. <laughs> Andy, would you do me a favor and put the speakerphone next to the, um, the owl? So that he can. Here? What'd you do, Nikki? What'd you do? Thank you. And so uh, we're Ryan, will be okay. Okay, <laughs> I'm just making sure. I uh, and well, we're here to represent Rampart Capital to um, uh, to further the progress that we've made. Um, through the last 
few weeks going on a uh, month now to uh, ensure that we're, we're building bulk, if we're growing bulk in the way that we make sure the betterment of Baltic is felt is to uh, get building permits going. Um, and we know that they're seized right now. And I hope we can uh, have a recommendation to city council to issue building permits again. Okay, does anybody have any questions to start asking? Or do you want a minute to look over some of the stuff? I think everybody should take a minute, minute to look over. I can walk through these as well. Um, I think that'd be helpful, Andy. Yeah. Thank uh, you. If you just make a let's yeah. let's start with the, the memorandum. Sorry, the flyer. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, so this is the memorandum that ISG has sent to uh, Grant Park Capital with issues uh, for lot lines and road control. Um, the meeting on Friday, last Friday, uh, with ISG and uh, City, we uh, compiled. Hey Andy, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have the memo up on the screen, but it's not the most updated version, I believe. <coughs> So right. just so you know, there may be some things that Andy's talking about that may or may not be on that document. And, just so you know. and so uh, this document that I have answers all of the responses uh, that I'm, I'm colorblind, so I'm just reading what that is, uh, bold blue, and I have uh, put together a response to the bold blue in uh, italicized red. Um, and as far as the lot lines go, we had Banner uh, come up with uh, footprints of houses that could put in uh, the concern lots uh, of the uh, concerns that planning and zoning city had. And uh, we would ask uh, if that would be adequate to give uh, reasonable evidences. Uh, for Phillips Crossing uh, and uh, Grant Park addition, if a variance is needed. If I remember right, those variances weren't very much. It was like a couple of feet here. A couple of feet here, a couple of feet there. Yeah. Um, and the variances in Grant uh, and Phillips Crossing, all the housing footprints fit within the lot lines. It was the deck. It, would be, it'd be the cover, yeah, it'd be covered back yeah. stuff yeah. like that that yeah. would cause the issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that was uh, the response for both. Uh, Andy, would you do me a favor? We tossed back one of those copies that I'm sitting in the white shirt with the glasses so he can Ready? review that. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Andy, sure. for your point of reference, Bob is the superintendent of the Baltic High School. Thank you, so, Can I have a question about that? Okay, so there was a problem with one of the properties that they couldn't put a covered deck on there. Is that the same with the new properties? Yes. So So are the people informed that they won't? So let me alliterate. So the original deal was when somebody requested about a variance to put a covered deck on their house because their lot wasn't deep enough to not encroach on the 25 foot setback in the rear lot line. So we looked at the lots to find out that from, it's, it's the ones on the cul-de-sac bulb where the cul-de-sac curves out while well, your setback has to start at the narrow spot of the lot. The rear setback has to be measured from the lot. The subdivision order says that you're supposed to have a hundred foot in that distance to allow 50 foot of buildable spacing for your housing. Well, there's, it's, I think it's six or seven, is it seven lots seven. in Phillips and like three lots in Grant Park that don't meet that requirement. So is what that basically means is they're very limited to the floor plans that they can build their houses at to try to keep it within the side setbacks, the front setbacks, the rear setbacks. Well, 
no matter what design of house you build, if you put a covered deck on it, you're going to be in that rear setback because there's not enough foot to put the houses in. So is what they proposed, and this, this picture in here doesn't have it drawn on there. So is what they did is they took some designs of houses, inline houses, um, houses with the garage in the front. To, and I, I just wanted to highlight the um, design equipment that was used uh, in making that are the designs that are uh, in place. One of them is one in place and then the other ones are houses that people have already decided to build on other lots that would fit in there. And a point of reference for those of you because we don't have it available to you, it is one of the visuals in the meeting that we have on the city website. So if you want to watch a recording, we're going to be talking a lot about this meeting we had last Friday, and you can clearly see the um, the proposed footprints that they made, and mm -hmm. you did a good job with that. We're, we apologize, we don't have that visual here today. Right, and uh, I was <coughs> in, unable to send that uh, before the meeting. So. Yeah, so with, with their footprints going on there, so is what they're asking is, basically that they leave the lots the way they are and give them a variance to not have the lots 100 foot in depth and then is what they're also asking in that is in a roundabout way how much of a variance we think would be allowed to encroach for covered decks or if they can't quite meet the seven foot side setbacks the front setback is set at 25 foot no matter what. So it would it would basically revolve around if we would allow the people after they buy the loss to issue another variance to allow them to be encroaching in the side and rear setbacks and how much we would allow is what they're proposing. Did I sum that up pretty pretty yeah. accurate yes, sir. So um as far as everything to work towards the reissuance of building permits. Um, one of the first things we would have to do on this subject between Grant Park and Phillips Crossing is we would have to have a motion to allow them to have a variance to not have the lots 100 foot in depth and work with the people building the houses if we want to allow any encroachment into the setbacks and how much we will allow. Yes, sir. Is that a good way to put it? Yes, sir. The only question I have, are you looking at side yard setbacks also? Because I'd say that is where you're going to have your most. That they, they requested that because, so basically, Baltic requires a seven foot side setback, okay? Sioux Falls is five foot, okay? Um, there's lots of towns that are only five foot. We have that seven foot. It's a good thing because then the houses ain't quite so close together and so cramped in there. But my recommendation with what um, Ryan said is with allowing the variance for the depth of the loss and then allowing the footprints, right now, just for fire reasons, they can't be no closer than five foot would be a recommendation because you got to have that that distance between the houses okay so i mean and then as far as the back goes with covered decks um i don't recommend or i won't recommend having it so that the houses can encroach on that 25 foot rear setback on their living area okay and then we would have to look at how much we were going to limit decks I mean, a wood deck without a roof over it, there is no restrictions. They can go a foot from the lot line. So it's just a matter of that covered part. Um, some communities, that covered deck doesn't fall underneath the setback requirements. Some communities it does. Ours is very vague on that part of it. Okay. So as far as the rear setbacks, I would recommend not allowing the houses to encroach on there with their livable space 
because of that 25 foot there for drainage and keeping stuff away from the back lot. Decks are elevated so they don't obstruct that, they don't cause problems there. Can we um, do this case by case scenario as the lots get developed? Yes. So we don't have to say, uh, have a motion to approve it all. Nope, is all we have to have a motion tonight is to allow them to have the less than 100 foot in depth of the lots. But with that, they're asked to, with that variance to allow the people building the houses to request minor variances for placing them on the lots for side easements, basically, is what it amounts to. Is this for talking point, the property that was in question that opened this whole discussion was the main foundation was within the setback. Yes. It's just they wanted a, they had two feet on the back yard that they could go to build a covered portion or a wall, kind of get a larger covered porch is two foot is, is it even worth it? And then they yeah. then at that point they asked, well how far can I go? You know, and that's kind of what you said it might be a case by case. In in I and that's where well, first, does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, Tony. I want the definition then of finished square feet. Here's why I'm asking. You keep referencing a roofed deck. Lakes County does not consider a roofed deck part of finished square feet. You're right, they don't. And there is also communities, there's also communities around here that don't closer. And there's some that do say that it's, it's none of it's livable space or none of it's finished space, okay? The livable space of a house is what I would refer to with that variance because a deck isn't livable. So basically is what that means is they could never put the deck on and then enclose it. You couldn't sleep in there. Uh, I mean, you could, but, you, you, but, you know, but that's why I'm asking because to me, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's got not a precedence here of yes, the covered deck does count towards the square footage, therefore it has okay. to fall within the 25. So, feet. no deck with a covered roof, according to the book, counts as finished square foot, okay, unless it is enclosed. Okay, so people put decks on their houses, they put roofs over them, then five years later they enclose them. Well, What's once the you definition of that? screens or no, 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 no the barriers. windows yeah. and the walls, they, they make yeah, physical barriers. barriers to the house. Yeah, physical barriers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that with allowing the variance to allow the last be a hundred foot, and the house has to stay within that not in that 25 foot front and rear of livable space would mean that they could never have a three season sport come the back to their house is what that would amount to if that clears that up a little bit so i'm trying to compare it to other situations where again I have to refer to lakes because that's what i'm dealing with our the porch whether it's roofed or not does not qualify as encroachment. As soon as they enclose the walls? We're allowed to have removable walls and it's not considered encroachment. Yeah, that's where I'll have to go from case by case. Yeah, and that's kind of why so. I'm, I'm, you, keep, you keep referring to the covered deck and it's kind of sparking my interest on that. And I, I guess maybe to help guide that, when putting putting guard wall with uh, uh, Foundation with that kind of so all all covered decks have to have a well I, I believe according to the national deal they have to have a minimum of 12 inch right. by, by 42 inch right. concrete pillar on all post <laughs> corners but not a but not a wall footing right. but you can have by definition with where Tony's at here you can take a deck with those posts and you can enclose that floor and insulate it and put walls on it and it is now finished living area. So 
because it meets the footing requirements underneath the state, uh, the building codes um, that we adopted back in, I think, 14 or something. And then they just re-looked at it recently. But um, so that covered roof still has qualified footings because you don't have to have a trench footing per se to be qualified as a footing because people do that all the time where they make houses where it's insulated and their house is part of the deck. So with what you're saying there, as soon as it's enclosed, and I mean, if they're heating it and stuff, it's considered living space, which then would encroach on that 25 foot rear setback, which is what I would recommend not allowing. The sides, case by case scenario, but I would say no more than that, you know, distance, but. Um, and if I may, yep. I have a question. Um, you're going a lot into detail on variances. Yep. And I listened to that meeting from Friday. And as a citizen, I'm wondering if you aren't just one step away from moving outside of the no building permits until you take care of some of the problems and some of the, and not some, the problems and the messes that you created in our community. And what I took away from that was, it seems like the priority with Grant Park and Phillips Crossing is, give us our building permits. We wanna build, we wanna build, we wanna build. We wanna get it in before winter. We want it framed before winter. We want, we want, we want. Well, I'm here to tell you, I want Murphy's Pond cleaned up. You spent $36,000 that is, that is of list. my money, and it is an eyesore. It is a mess. I want not to have flooding and roads that are closed and drainage from people's neighborhood property and a silt fence that stays up so we don't continue to have the same problems. And I would hope that you guys are all going to stand the line on the decision that was made and not buckle under the repeat request for building permits. Because once those permits are out there, what leverage do we have? What voice does this town have to get these things that they don't consider a priority that I consider a priority now? We're going to work. We're addressing these issues as we go. So we're on item A. It could be on item C and E, but we got to do it step by step by step. But if you're so, voting on this, this is listed first because it's their priority. No, it's so listed because it's the order of, of what was sent into them. It, there's no. This is the order that was put into the ISG response letter to them, which just happened to be number one on the list. Okay, um, there's several things on the list. Okay, um, as far as um, yeah. what? Yeah. yeah. So, Deb, what we're doing is we're going through the memorandum to make sure everybody's on the same page after everybody's leaving the meeting. And there's still the issue of, um, so there may be decisions made on this memorandum. <laughs> and the winner is. <laughs> and the winner is. <laughs> and so um, there may be decisions made on the memorandum depending on what PNC wants to do. But there is also what is called the development agreement, which will be a legal agreement between the city and the developer that will also cover some other items. And so there, this is a two-fold thing. So it's not that we're not hearing what you're saying. We just wanted to make sure you understood the process. Okay. I understand the process. Mm -hmm. They keep bringing their voice. Mm -hmm. They want building permits. Sure. I want the mess taken care of. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing my voice sure. saying, clean up the mess. You made the mess. Not discounting, Take care not of the discounting mess. your opinion at all, Ben. And we are not, trust me, because there's been a lot of, lot of, lot of conversations. Um, misprinted stuff that's not necessarily all true that was sent out regards to stuff with um, letters and stuff, which we'll get to later. Um, but as far as the 
the issues with stuff for the reasons why <coughs> the building permits the, the building permits were suspended is yes because things weren't being done on a timely manner things had to be stopped so that things were brought up to the requirements that were required not only by our subdivision ordinances our zoning codes and the state of south dakota sdnr okay that's why it got to where it was okay now as far as one of the items that was on the list <coughs> for why the building permits were suspended was because the plots weren't legal, legal because the lots didn't meet the requirements and i understand okay. that. I so we can allow a variance to allow the lots not to be 100 percent there with them knowing that they are restricted to what they build on those lots okay so that's one of the items that has to be cleared up before there is even a vote whether or not we reestablish building permits or hold them yet until more work is satisfactory or uh there's the agreements met uh, by the parties well i might be naive but if they can get contractors out here to get frame buildings up in time for winter, they can get contractors out here to take care of that pond, both the to take care of the flooding issue over there and Murphy's. No, that's, okay, that's but what you, what you're not understanding though is we got to do this one step at right. a time, and and Murphy's pond you to clean out and dredge in the winter time. It cannot be done now. It would be way it's, better in the winter. Time. It's way easier in the winter time. Okay, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I agree with you, but we got to move on one step at a time. Okay. So, if there's no other questions, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. Okay. So, as a city employee, I'm just wondering. So, are you saying that? Um, Lots will be less than 7,500 square no, feet. No, the lots all meet. So the lots all meet the width requirement of 66 feet at the lot lines because it's a cul de sac. So um, most lots have to be 66 foot minimum at the street. Cul de sacs, because the lots are angled, that measurement gets moved back to the property line in the front, not the set. It's the setback line. It's the setback line that they get moved back to. All the lots meet that requirement. All the lots meet the 7,500 square foot minimum. The only issue is because of the way the lots are shaped, the depth of the lots don't meet the subdivision regulation of 100 foot. So need to make a motion to either. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I have sorry. one more thing. Um, I've worked at a couple different cities and um, a variance the definition of a variance is due to a hardship. Um, an unnecessary hardship must be established by the applicant. Um, in towns that in cities I worked in, it's usually old neighborhoods. Yeah. Variances are issues that never had double garages, and you know situations like that. Um, usually. Not in the and that's, that's all I to add. Okay, so with the hardship thing, the way I read it, I don't remember which page the page 55. Page 55. Um, there's a lot of pages to yeah. remember. <laughs> um, so, um, So to prove a hardship on a new lodge. That hasn't been built on. Okay, so with your hardship, if you read down, it says, um, 
In the absence of a variance, an owner can make no feasible or reasonable use of the property, convenience, loss for profit, financial limitations. So if we don't issue the variance, there's no use of the property. It's dead property. So that's where it would fall underneath the hardship. I just, I got to answer the question for what, it's, what it says in John. Well, it, it, it's a discretionary test. I think both Linda and Ed have valid points for discussion and are doing a great job of laying out the issues. Um, it's ultimately up to the discretion of the PNC Commission to make a recommendation to grant or deny a variance. I, I think the, the case for the variance is well articulated. The unfortunate thing is it was a wholly preventable problem just by having followed the subdivision regulations, which I have been in effect for 21 years. And Jim Lendland uh, was responsible for uh, <coughs> formulating those. And so to have a development like this progress with, with such obvious deficiencies, um, fundamentally, what is more basic about a, a subdivision development than lot sizes? Find me a more simple fundamental element and so this, the PNZ in the city is put in this position of having to deal with an emergency that's not of its own making. Um, but that being said, uh, there's obviously a significant public interest involved in resolving this. And, uh, and I wanna direct your attention that this is an immediate action item. And this nine page memorandum which has been written, responded to, replied to, responded to and replied to again uh, states that building permits will res resume after the immediate action items <coughs> are resolved to the city's satisfaction so the requirements are very plain um, but it is up to the this body to decide whether the language of the ordinance is met and there's also case authority um, and the standard that Sioux Falls follows is is the intent, is the intent of the ordinance being met? Well, the intent is to be pro-development. Pro Who would ever have an intent to make it impossible for these lots to be built on? So, so, but Linda, you probably deserve either an increase in your salary or a vacation <laughs> or something. We don't know. She is worth way more than we can. Because you're is that, uh, that being recorded? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We'll use that in your uh, evaluation at the end of the year. Okay, timestamp that so we got that. And then also just a point of order for everybody in the audience. Um, the, those people don't who understand who the Jim Wenlin reference. That is the previous P and Z president that was on the previous P and Z council that had that position for decades. That also helped craft the ordinances that were utilized to develop the Grant Park and the Phillips Crossing subdivision. So that is where the challenge is for the current PNZ. It's difficult for us to navigate the decision-making process of the previous administration approving something that so clearly does not follow the ordinances they constructed themselves. So now these people are in a very difficult situation of trying to figure out how to adhere to ordinances that were not followed by the people who wrote them. Just so y'all understand the context of that. So with Linda's question about the hardships and stuff, so as planning and zoning as the city is what we need to look at is kind of along the lines of the land is useless if I mean, you're going to have dead lots that will never have a house on, never pay taxes to the city, um, basically just sit there forever abandoned. <laughs> so as us being planning and zoning, that's where we need to look at if it's in the best interest of the city, the, the, the taxpayers, and everybody else to allow if people buy these lots to build a house that's suitable to be able to be placed on the lot and contribute to the city. Another point that Ed um, 
we also need to follow the covenants of the development and the covenants require a certain size house on that yes. ground too. And so that is the second layer that makes us a very difficult decision. I mean, USPNZ can approve tiny houses on those lots yep. and say, you know what, you can build houses, but you can put tiny houses on there, but then they're in violation of the covenants of the of development. So there's multiple layers. And, well, and that's, oh, sorry. Well, couldn't the lots be made bigger and just have fewer houses? I mean, couldn't it be divided? These lots, three would have two. No, because the way the lots are positioned, the depth can't change because the curb and the lot line in the front is locked and the rear lot line is locked. Okay. Um, the ones that are between the two cul-de-sacs, yeah, technically they could make one lot out of the whole the whole thing from one street to the next street, but that kind of goes against some other ordinances that says you can't do that because you can't have dual access access to lots so with that being said next to tearing out the whole road and the infrastructure that was already in place and redesigning and starting over there is really no other options and that's where they said about the encroaching on the side setbacks <coughs> is to make it so that the houses meet the minimum requirements of the square footage what is that on that one there, I can't tell you because Grant Park and Phillips Crossing are different. And I don't know the exact numbers of the minimum per square foot. And do you know the requirements of the covenants for that? Not off the top of my head, but okay. they should be in line with. Uh, this, the, they're the standard quo. Right? I mean, they're, yeah. I mean I, Grant Park, I would like to say was like 1,400 square foot, but some of the lots, their covenants are weird because there's actually a gentleman that works for the state of Mini or well, I shouldn't say the state. He works for Minnehaha County. He came here from Minneapolis. He was actually looking at buying the largest lot on the the cul-de-sac that supports this street on the far south end. And it was just him and his wife. And he actually said that the only problem was is because of the size of the lot, they had to build such a big house that they didn't want. It's more than what they wanted to meet the covenants' requirements. So there's a minimum, but there's also, I believe, a minimum depending on the size of the lot. That is exactly how it is. So there's a minimum requirement of square footage for the house based on the size of the square footage of the lot. Yeah, and then there's a minimum size, and then it goes from there up. Correct. So, so Which is not as necessarily as strict as the cities. The cities isn't anywhere close to that strict. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they went above and beyond the city to try to make it so that there was, well, basically they're trying to fill the lots with the most house that they can get, which benefits the city in a roundabout way because they pay more taxes then. Right. So. so the question at hand is whether or not the PNZ is amenable to allowing um, some- A variance, leeway, yeah. a variance in the depth of the lots at present time with a case by case. So so we need to make a motion. Can I ask one more oh. question? Okay, so you're talking about just like a covered deck. What if somebody comes in down the road and they want a fence? Fence they... fence don't fall. So fences can be right on the lot line. Okay. So that that depth of the lot has no in the back. 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 Okay. No, we're we're good there for now. So I, I got I got a question. Okay. You know these lots aren't a hundred foot. Well, by rights, if that lot is a hundred foot, there should be no variance for a deck or anything. So if you allow these lots to go like they are, for each lot, why don't you limit the variance they can get for their covered porch? So the, the same distance it's short from being a hundred foot, and then you should be right. So with that being said, a deck without a roof on it, and our, ours are very vague on if that roof is actually considered a roof. unless it's enclosed. Okay. So in, <clears throat> in a roundabout way, it's a real great area if they even need a variance to put a covered deck into that 25 foot setback. Right, I, I, I get that, but okay, you got a 94 foot lot. 
yep. six foot short of your hundred. So if that yep. person wants to build a covered Sorry. deck, allow them the six foot variance that they're missing off of their hundred feet. I got what then, you're saying. Okay. So here's a thought. If they've got covenants that say You've got this size lot, you have to have this size house, but this size lot doesn't meet the city requirements. And they're looking for a variance because eventually they're going to want a covered porch. Why not have them do the wiggle room in their covenant and say you can have a house this size so you've got room for your covered deck? So with what you're saying there, um, so... Because the lots meet the 7,500 square foot minimum, they all all their minimum size houses meet the city requirements. Because their minimum size house is based on the square foot of the lot, so all the lots are over 7,500 square foot. Their shape is just wrong, so the depth isn't right. So, and with it being a cul-de-sac, if so if they were straight lots and they didn't meet the depth, they could just make a longer house and get get to their lot lines because they have that footage. Well, with a with a cul-de-sac lot, your lots are angled, so you're limited on your length of your house because your lot's narrower in the front than it is. In the front. So, um, as I like what Nate said about the allowing the a covered deck to go X amount of feet in the back. But it still wouldn't be livable space. No, but what I'm saying is if you did that, whatever that lot short, that's what they get for a variance. Then this person can't come and say, well, this person got a 14 foot variance and you're only going to give me a 12. You get what you get to equal your 100 foot, and that's what you got. That's how you make reasonable variance. Building for guests. It's all governed by building for us. It, it just, so if the right, covenants are fresh tomorrow, you have a whole new. Yeah. That is unmanageable. Well, well so, yeah. that, that's yeah, we that's a that. whole. Right, okay. right, sorry, I'm thinking to the devil's advocate. Right, you brought up the previous P and Z. Okay, the new P and Z is in. Nobody there has any clue that their variance was granted. So they are. They they do have a clue. So once you have a variance, it doesn't go away. So I have variance on my lot. To put a garage in the backyard, seven foot from the lot line. That is registered with the county on my flat to have that variance. The ordinances they changed them after that to get rid of that twenty-five foot because there could have possibly been an alley. So now my lot, technically my garage, is within the new ordinances, but I still have a variance that's registered at the plat on my property. To have that, so right. it doesn't go away. It's 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 there. What I think Tony's saying is, if all of a sudden this whole board is gone and there's four lots left to build on, what's to hold that new board to uphold a variance that you guys have thrown out there? I think where Tony is at, yeah. kind of where yeah. you're going it, at. There's so no generational. No, it's not with any council with anything. Yeah. Nothing yeah. holds yeah. anybody. Yeah. They can say they can put big because big it happened to me at Minnehaha County. It with those commissioners. You're right on that aspect. They could issue a different variance to allow something different. But with that being said, I would just so could we in, to in theory stop arguments between other people. It makes it fair because then it makes every lot technically a hundred foot. Put that in the put that in the motion. Put it in the motion. So it's John, in the motion. I, I make a motion to make the short lots get a variance to equal the hundred foot lot line variance. I don't know how you want me to say that. 100 foot depth. 100 foot depth. So if a lot is only 94 feet, that house gets a six foot variance to make it equal to 100 foot. With non livable. With non livable quarter. Then do you want to read that back to us so that way you're all listening to the same ones? Okay. Um, you can read a motion to make. The lots that are short of 
let's say 100 foot depth, obtain a variant to equal 100 feet with non-livable quarters. Okay, so the, the distance from your measured depth versus your required depth be converted to a variance for non livable space. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That's very good. Track. So basically, your measured, yeah. your measured depth, the difference from your measured depth to your required depth, that, that difference be made into or converted to a variance for non livable space on that lot. Will that be the maximum variance? Yes. Because right. isn't that what he was saying? Yeah. yeah. That would be the max. Yeah. Yes. I would identify the lots. I think that's going to be a better way to do this. So with that approved, that nothing can exceed that six foot variance. Whether it's a deck, whether it's anything, anything non livable space cannot exceed that. I'm just using six foot as an example. Oh, okay. Nothing can exceed that. Variance. So, um, <coughs> so the variance you were talking about earlier, I believe he already has his 25 feet for that covered porch. Okay, so that house that we're referring to, his covered porch was going to be seven feet into the rear step back. Yeah. And if this this covered deck and still meet every other requirement, so he doesn't have a hundred. No, okay. he's only got. I think it was eighty four or eighty six feet on that lot. I don't have the picture. I don't have the. Let's see one of these two. He's this lot number two on Carroll. It's very inexact numbers, but you're probably talking five feet. Yeah, I got. Well, so I got. I'm trying to remember. Um, oh, um, okay. Yeah, but if you count the curl plus your your because it's measured ten feet off of uh, curl, curl. And then it, kills you. it is. That's mm -hmm. that's where the problem. Um, the new lot line. You got the, okay, so here we go. Um, we can refer to this real quick for the lots. So the lots in oh, um, you're in Grant Park. That's Grant Park. Here's Phillips Cross. Okay, so it would be lots one and two, five and six on Carroll Circle. It would be lots one, two. Five and six on um, Nicole Cove, and it's lots one and five on um, Ronald Court. Mm -hmm. In Phillips Crossing, and then it's lots. Um, this, this is a full picture. 13 and 17 on Elizabeth Oh, uh, there's four of them actually. Uh, there's 12, 13, 18, 17. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's it. Up there. Okay. If you see 12, 13, 18, and 17, which is the entrance into the cul de sac. Uh, no, it's 16, 17, 13, and 14. There we go. Them are the ones. Thank you, thank you. So, I'm Elizabeth. Ed, yep. lot six so on Carol yeah. Circle, isn't that legal? Yeah. 116 by 100? Well, they, one and six. six. Don't know. Um, yeah. No, the side chunk is too narrow, just a yeah. little bit of it. Right what, right here? Yeah. That, that line is so that's why they included it. So, they included it in their drawings because this. Pin right here is back. There's two pins here on this lot. Okay. So this back side here is not, doesn't meet the 100 foot because of a pinning or something. Okay. Is, what it, is how it worked out because they put it all on their CAD deals with the actual measurements and figured out which lots were 
because like this one, these two were close. Yeah, because I mean that's 120. Yeah, and that's at 100. Yeah. So okay, it it has something to do with the pin placement. Yeah. Okay. But it don't hurt if they're in there because they right. stay out on foot. So if even if it is one right, just foot, yeah, it's just yeah. foot. So. Right. But just for legality reasons, have them listed. So Linda, why don't you read it again so everybody knows what's going on? Okay. Was there a second to Nate's motion? Uh, yeah. No, I yeah. want to hear it again. Good, good. good. And there, just hold, hold that thought. <laughs> the measured lot depth minus the difference to the required lot depth be made a ver maximum variance for non livable structures. Livable space. Livable space. space. Okay. Non livable space. Um, are you going to add? Um, Unspecified lot. lots one, two, five, and six Carol. on Carroll Circle. One, two, five, and six on the Cole Cove. Lots one and five on Ronald Court. And then lots. What did I say? Hey, Deb, can you go back to the other, the Grant Park one? Okay. Yeah, the lot numbers are not there. Oh, there sorry. <laughs> the, lot, the lot numbers are not there. Lots 13, 14, 17, and 16 on Elizabeth Avenue in Grant Park. So, so that's more ball. than the original set. Except for the very end one. We weren't sure if that was the right one. Oh. Okay, so that's the motion on the table with the first. Is that what your you guys, motion, John? Is that your motion, Nate? Yes, that was my motion. Good job on that motion. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody second that motion? I will Do you have something to add? No, 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 no. Oh. We're, it's all going well. I will second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. Can we have an additional comment? Public comment on this is oh, I'm asking for permission for this. Can I have just make a comment on the precedence you're setting on this? Yep. Precedence that you've just established is you defined a hardship. To allow a developer to come in, guns blazing, and establish a hardship by putting curb and gutter in. If you just made an avenue on a new development to define hardship. I think there's going to be a little bit off of that too, though, because we'll be more prepared to understand where there is an issue as well. I didn't know that this was a problem. Nobody ever brought it up that it was a problem. I wish somebody would have or somebody smarter than myself caught it before then. Um, I personally believe that hopefully this issue doesn't happen again, hence the variance. But valid point. This this right. issue was here before any of us were right. appointed to this committee. So at this point, we okay. are just trying to yes. fix what is wrong because there's not a whole lot we can do about it now. Yeah. And that's what these communications back and forth between. Mm -hmm. Uh, you guys uh, it's been productive uh, and uh, look forward to going through the rest of this. To Tony's point, though, if this had been a fence, like the one you mentioned earlier, we'd have made them rip the fence out, but it wasn't reasonable to make them tear out curb and gutter. No, it's not just curb and gutter, though. It's, I, it's I, I, there's a it, lot more to it than curving gutter. It's a multi million dollar development, right. which uh, is vital to the future growth and stability of Baltic. That's the, the frame, the, the framing I put around it. Yeah. We all want this development to be successful because if we can make this successful, that means future developments will hopefully look at coming here. But we just got to be more prepared to follow and make sure everything is up to standards prior to the approvals. Vision. 
Yes. Yes, and that's where the public comes in handy and in mind when the DNZ meetings meet to voice those concerns at those meetings. But right now we need to focus on the list at hand, get through this list so we could figure out what's going on. Okay, so let's go to number two. two. We're getting there. Ooh, we're number two. We're getting there. <laughs> um, uh, the ISG uh, stated that uh, planning and zoning uh, uh, saw that Phillips Crossing needed some uh, drainage easements, and uh, we had an exhibit to the um, memo that il illustrates where the proposed <coughs> easements shall be, and it's between block two and three, block three and four. Um, and when we wrote that, they just wanted to see uh, a drawing representing that. Well, so with that being said, there is more so than, everybody can oh. see where this is. Sorry, guys. Um, you'll see Valley views right there. And then you have Fifth Street coming right up right by the school. Oh, this is no, this is this, this is Phillips Crossing. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. No, no, you're fine. I got all jumpy about for Pete's sake. I know. I look at me. It, it's the area between there you go. Sorry about it's that. Go up there. <laughs> It, it's up, other, sorry, move the picture up. Other. There you go. My bad, my bad. So it's right here, yep. the 12 foot easement, and right here, 12 foot easement. Yep, sorry, my bad. Okay, and there's a little bit more to it than just showing the easement, having the easement that's required. It also goes to fences that drainage easements, you're not allowed to put a wooden fence right. in that easement, which has to do with st preventing the flow of water and causing backups upstream. So that's that's more so the reason that that needs to be established. And we're uh, proposing uh, putting those green cheeses in places. Um, and that's what that point. Uh, so that one's good. We can move on because that there will just have to be approved once it's Formally uh, submitted. So. Andy, did you get the mitigation reports on the water downflow into the adjacent property? To uh, Grant, Grant Park? Or? Yep. Um, we were doing the easements that were between those two city blocks, and then the water ran to 7th Street. And then when it, it went to the city lot that has the lift station, and then I had asked on the Friday's meeting to get the mitigation reports to show that the water flow will be acceptable going into the adjacent landowner's land. And so I'm just wondering if those mitigation reports are provided in your packet. Not not in this packet, but um, in that meeting, we were saying that it goes to the natural waterway with that. Right, but and at what rate? What's that? At what rate? I'm not. They didn't They sorry. didn't get that. Yeah. They're working on those numbers. Yeah. Okay, so right. we still have that as an action item as yes. mitigation? Yes. Okay, cool. So what about lots 10 and 15? 10 and 15 on um, which? Because you got your still way dumping right into okay. those. So the curb and gutter, the whole street runs to lot nine. Everything slopes to the valley gutter at lot nine. So all that water from those areas hits the pavement, follows the curb and gutter, there's inlet boxes, and then it goes out lot. There's a uh, storm sewer pipes that run under lot nine and Drain to the natural drain. So that one there, basically, so we can move on from that one there. We need the action item yet of getting the numbers to make sure there's nothing required as per to the flow rate coming into the adjacent property. Right. And we and then you have to get the the plotting thing done so that we can get it approved and then uh for item or before going i guess uh good for number three yep we're on okay. number three there's uh, no motions or nothing to for that thing, so. uh, and this one was informative uh where we got the swift with the contractor and owner signing and it's continually being updated for the first construction in the unit did we ever find the um, SWIFT reports prior to June 19th, or did we agree that there that's is report one. number one? Uh, we don't have them available. So I was at the inspection. 
personally. Yeah. Um, there is no inspections documented prior to that meeting with the DNR. The only thing on that yet though is they have not put the signs up we, we can at the developments that have the required information for people to call with problems and stuff. So we can uh, part of this is no I just point that out that is, that that still has not been done. And he's uh, having that conversation with you. I, I, I've I've taken notes. Yep. So okay. <clears throat> so uh, or yep. So are the signs posted going to become part of this document since it's not on the document now? We can. That'd be great. Thank you. Is the mitigation report on the action item for for that because that was conversation I didn't see it in the document. Is that going to be added to the document? Yeah, that needs to be added to. We can add that. Thank you. What What about? Wasn't Doug in here our last meeting talking about drainage between the development and his house? Does there need to be an easement there too? Also, oh, you're referring to the backs of lots one, two, and three on Carroll yes. Circle. Yes, there Ryan, does. you can address that when you were part of the conversation, right? Yeah. Um, I live on Sixth Street and one of the lots, six nine or seventy seventy one, one of them lots. Um, one of them. One of them, yeah. I don't know which one. Okay. Know where he lives. <laughs> anyway, so when they went, when they came in and took out all the hills on the land and redid the sloping on on further review and looking at it from the northwest corner of lot three, it does appear to me, and like I said, I don't have any of the locations or whatever, but it appears to me that it does drain towards this way. Supposed to, to the south to the lotted easement between five and two of Carroll Circle. And that's because they can't dump water onto his existing property. Right. So, I mean, it does look to me that it drains to this line and goes to the east. That's the way the plan show it then. Yeah. Right. Well, so, I mean, yeah, visually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the actual plans with the, the plans with the grading shows it draining this way. This lot actually breaks. It, it runs this way a little bit and oh, okay. that way. So. so there shouldn't be an issue building on lot three then? Shouldn't be because the lots, the way it's shaped, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay. The only question is, is if there should be a 12 foot drainage easement behind the three and four. Oh, that's a good point, Ed. Coming yeah. out. Because if that water is designed to come around and comes off the previous addition back there, that backs lots three and four, if there's fences built there, it'll do the same thing. It'll prevent that water from flowing to the proposed drainage easement and then backing up onto the non, um, non-city land, basically, because they're not annexed in at... Um, not. Yeah, they're not part of the city. I can never remember their last name. No Hobbs. No Hobbs. No 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 yeah. no so I think that needs to be addressed with, and like I said, the biggest reason why that drainage has been is so that they can't put fences in it. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Ed. There should be one on the west side of lot three and four. Because, yeah, majority of Valley View, my backyard and all them, they do drain the lot three. And then it goes down the slope and then comes back, back the to south. the south. Yeah. I think it's also important to mention either in the document or in the um, development agreement that although all of us recognize that there is grass cover, thankfully now in this development, the developer also agreed that as houses are built, they will make sure that they adjust the grading on any unconstructed properties to ensure that this proper water flow continues as the development fills. And that, right? that's, that? part, that's part of it. Perfect. Thank you. So, and with the note on that, um, <coughs> still not really impressed with them on that deal with the, with the vegetation because it was pointed out in that meeting when the SWIP reports started that those lots needed to be filled in at a positive grade. And I actually found it in the subdivision ordinances that it does refer to all right away is need to be graded properly from the lot lines to the street. So the fact that they didn't do that and just planted grass on it is still very 
discouraging because it does cause major problems with the erosion. And so, there are still many lots that don't. So just a note on that for records. So we will, we will note it. Um, so the, the what the major takeaway I gotten from this is a, an additional easement is pointed out between uh, block two and the valley view addition. Yeah, that last three and four on yep. Carroll Circle there, yes. Yeah. Okay. That was a good catch in. Okay. Okay. Um, and then Going on to, or are we good to go to number four? Yep. Okay. Um, the uh, number four, we just, we're going to number four? Yeah, yep, number yeah. four, the call for that, so. Yeah. And so we're going to clean that up. Uh, we understand that uh, it will be uh, continually monitored and it will be due diligently making sure we're just taken care of. Number five, what uh, the mayor just said, uh, as the houses uh, get developed, Grand Park Capital will uh, be taking care of the uh, downstream houses impacted by them. There is one item missing on Phillips Crossing. Or wait a minute here. No, it's down farther. Sorry about that. Never mind. Oh, it's, it's down in the park. It's, it's down farther. <laughs> so now we're into the action items in Phillips Crossing. Um, uh, this is, goes to what uh, you and uh, Mayor were talking about about the section three, four, three, four, six, thirteen. Yeah. Next. Uh, uh, ensure erosion control practices and implemented at all times of constructions. Uh, we've done significant work on uh, the controls and, and implementation at all times, and we, we note that it will be monitored uh, till the end, and we'll be working diligently to ensure the compliance. Andy, would it be reasonable to ask the developer in the areas that vegetation hasn't grown fully yet to get that dirt up to code or up to where it's supposed to be? Because there's still a lot of. Uh, if there's only one problem with that, yeah. they have to do it all if they do part of it. Got it, it, okay. it goes back to the same thing as somebody builds Is a house. Away? Yeah, well, okay. no, if somebody builds a house, they're going to dam it up. They got to come in and fill it up till the Scott Pond is so it slopes. Well, if they go do one lot, then it's the same as somebody builds a house. So then they got to do the next lot, and then it, it's just a it's a chain reaction at that point in time. So, if I'm to understand correctly, the priority is the vegetation, so we don't have the erosion. Mm -hmm. right Correct. Yes. So. Is there a projected time when the city will be taking over on that um, for the flushing of the sewer and all that? That's Weed. what is called accepting accepting the development, and we don't have a projected timeline at this time. Usually so there's testing. Because it sounds like a number of these problems could be ongoing for a period with so various different houses being developed. With what you said, even once the city takes acceptance of the development, the developer is still responsible for cleaning out the storm sewer. When, as if a storm comes through and causes problems, the developer is still responsible with, for that until. It's done. A great case in point is Nielsen has been doing that while they're finishing up their development because they're just finishing up their, lap, their last lots. And so even though their development was accepted per se, um, the um, all of the, they've had to clean out those. Inlets. Those, yeah, those inlets, thank you. They had to clean those out when there was some runoff and things that they had to fix too. So there's- Because it sounds like the erosion is going to continue for so once the houses are all established so all the lots are filled then the developer basically can be required to clean it out one last time if there's sediment there and if everything looks good then he's not really required to but once all the houses are done then if there's anything else then it's the city after after all the houses are done 
but the developer is responsible until that point in time. And then for the punch list items, uh, uh, all of them we're uh, are going to ensure the hydrants are at least at 0.1 foot above the curb. Uh, uh, straightening the hydrants on the South Lovely on Seventh, um, uh, and all all of the hydrant issues uh, pointed out, um, and those are uh, punch list and warranty items between. Metro and Grant Park Capital. As far as the sidewalk for 7th Street uh, to be installed, um, I was just talking to a contractor that would like to get it done actually this week, as soon as this week. Um, and I said, hold on, <laughs> we need to, <laughs> we need to uh, finalize the, the discussion on that. Um, uh, so that they can play it accordingly. What did we find for the the lot, the last <coughs> lot line to the adjoining road? What did we find for that? Uh, well, that's we we didn't. Well, that's what we need to discuss on. Did we have an ordinance that referred to that, John? I can't remember. Um, and and we looked at that this today, I think yeah. it was. I think I have the ordinances. Do you have it handy? Yeah, I think I have mine. Did you email me or you got them? I did, but I, so I will grab them for you. Yeah. It's, it's March 2nd, 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 2
abutting existing sidewalks to sidewalks within the subdivision shall confirm to the width of the existing abutting, abutting <coughs> sidewalks. So with that being said, the for the sidewalk coming to an end where the concern is on the paperwork here, the problem is the entrance off of Lovely is yeah. part of the plotting. So technically that curving gutter should come out and wrap the corners, even though Lovely could be changed at some point in time, it should still be there to control that intersection. So we don't have dead any curbs. That would also mean the culverts are not long enough at 7th Street because they would have to go to the 66 foot in length so that the sidewalks can have the ADAs at the corners. Okay. So, and for historical purposes, we had a conversation. When the sidewalk comes up here, um, it would be like the bridge of Terabitha, you know, like the bridge of Dover, because it would just stop. And so, what the city is asking for, because this section here, the little ditch that goes here abuts up to Lovely. What we're asking for is the sidewalk to go up to the street as though that will become an intersection someday and being prepared for that and having ADA compliant entrances to that, which would probably require an alteration of the ditch of it because it looks like the culvert was too short. It was way too short for that. It was just created for the entrance. So um, there would need to be some adjustments there, but if we do believe that it's in the best interest of the city and for the the students to get a safe walkway to the, the school. Now, I understand the city's going to have to address this you, this issue, and trust me, we will be addressing it, but we need the developer to at least, in good faith, get it as far as they need to, and then we'll take it from there. And if you, if I went out there and stood, and on the one side, it's a really nice grade, so if you're going east, it doesn't, you know, it looks like you just continue with the grade, but we elongate the culvert, but when you're going to the west, it's a little bit of a deeper slope. So if we get that curve and gutter there, all you have to do is grade that out and make it smoother so it's not a hazard to have that, right. that there. And so it would be elongating, elongating the culvert and then making that grade in the ditch, you know, a little more walkable until we can get it fixed otherwise so we can get the kids to the school. Okay. Um, I... A lot of information yep. and uh, she talks fast. I know I talk too fast. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's totally okay. Um, we can have Justin send. Thank you. Yeah, that'll yes. be an action item on our part, but yeah. I just wanted for the purposes of discussion, everybody understood what we were talking about. If we could have ISG send us, uh, I will talk to Justin so that he gets go. what we need. So. Very good. Ari's on it. Ari is a representative from my oh, 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 okay. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, right, again? I, I didn't see Justin, Justin, so I didn't even know. No, no, right. So, sorry about that. So, Ari is playing Justin yeah. in the movie. Tonight, I so. for Justin Perfect. So, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Um, and the re uh, testing reports um, we do have the bacteria testing uh, report. I've been trying to get a hold of Metro for. Uh, the last uh, two days and it's been phone tag, um, but um, uh, I'll admit the biggest concern was yes. the bacteria test. Yeah, and with you, so. um, uh, I do apologize. I can send that first thing in the morning to you guys uh, for Grant Park and Phillips Crossing. Happy to send it. Absolutely. And are you getting Justin's phone of emails? I'm not. Steve is. Uh, okay. All right. So you need to send it to Justin, yep. and then it's getting forwarded to Steve Watson, so we'll be okay. And that, I've been uh, forwarding it to Steve, too. Perfect. So Perfect. Steve and Justin are on there. Both. Oh, that's great. Very good. Okay. Before we move on, i got to go back to 7th Street sidewalk. Yep. Sure. Since that's against um, out-of-city lot, we was the city, the city has to move the school there. Okay. And mall and all that other good, fun stuff. Well, that. Until the development's done, actually, it's the developer's responsibility. I understand that, so, but afterwards, yes, it will be. Once the city takes it over, it'll be no different than the bike trail, because okay. the okay. city has to. Once everything's handed over, the city has to mow and, and because that was concerning ducks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, thank that's, you. That's where that is. Like I said, it's the same as the bike path. Okay, thank you. 
Congratulations, Ryan Potts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 hey, we're all the time. <laughs> 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 Salary, there's no other. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get you a brush. We'll get you a brush. <laughs> Okay. So, Grand Park edition. Uh, we're, we're getting there, guys. Um, for uh, the drainage concerns in Grand Park, um, uh, Banner had proposed to uh, put a detention pond in on block number one of Grant Park. Now I'll put up the right. There you go. <laughs> there we go. She's the one she was trying to get to. The one I was there. jumping to. Lots one, two, three, and four. So yeah. right when you enter in that curve, there we go. It'll be there. You go. There you 500, go. 50, there you go. Two, 504, and 506. What, yeah. what people in Baltic would affectionately call the old lumber yard dirt pile, <laughs> right? So, uh, we are working with Banner, um, to get that design as soon as possible, uh, but uh. After conversations with them at that Friday meeting, um, uh, we were all in agreement that this is possible. It solved issues of downstream uh, concerns, um, and that was uh, number one. And it bleeds into number two as well. And three. One, two, and three. Yeah. Uh, uh, it kind of bleeds all into it, and we can go through it as, as we do. Um, there was a concern that ISG had with the uh, uh, original 2021 analysis and the uh, 2022 drainage memo that we recently sent. And there's a lot of engineering talk in there mm -hmm. that I would like to summarize, uh, saying the newest report takes into account the entire drainage into the proposed detention pond where the 2021 drainage study focused just on grant park addition as there was no uh detention pond which email was that just so we have we're clear when you said you sent that this um no you had sent um one of the engineering documents today mm -hmm. or is that a different one a different one I don't know. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to attach which document you're re you're referring to. That oh, the 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 analysis. Yeah. Um, that was uh, the drainage report uh, that the banner had initially sent to ISG, and then we sent another one with the detention pond. That's the one so that. So the one initially was the 2021 water mitigation, or was that? No, this is the one that. Uh, Assumed the drainage analysis was 13.6 acres instead of the seven instead of the 18 acres. And then the newest one, when was that set? In September, uh, that for, for that meeting. Yeah, right. And or then the was there a new one that was just sent today? No. Or that's a different one. No, the newest one was one that we sent to uh, ISG for that meeting. Okay, and that's where Justin was asking where the baseline came from. Yes. Do we know where the baseline came from? Yeah, it came from the entire. Uh, Scope of I would you know. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. I have a question. On the original plans for this, there was a retention pond in there and it was taken out, put into lots. How come you just don't go back to that original plan and use that retention pond I write on that? There was I don't think there was a plan. detention pond for that, no. Drainage was a concern when they first were talking about it. They were talking about ideas of how to curb drainage there, but I don't think it was ever a Detention, the detention pond, the only one that I remember was on the top of the hill on the south end of Towards the Towards the yeah. That is the only one that was ever on the plans. Yeah. You're it was. Here, right? There was one over here once. Yeah, that's what I thought. I haven't mm -hmm. even seen that. Yeah. Oh, you mean in, in Phil's yeah. crossing? There, oh, sorry, oh. there was one over here. <laughs> there was lots of different discussion. Lots of them. <laughs> So for the Grand Park Capital, yep. uh, that's uh, what ISG Banner, the City of Baltic, and Grand Park Capital will discuss. And um, we're continually working with ISG to get the uh, plan going in, in motion after we get this agreement going. Well, and if I can answer Debbie's um, concern about that, I think the reason why they went to those lots is a there's a natural waterway there on the back corner of Radix 
property, and then there is a that mm -hmm. that water. I don't know what you want to call it, but the blue line that went through the back of that. Mm -hmm. And um, no, it wasn't an easement. What's it called with the reeds and everything? The natural the pile. The wetlands. The wetlands. wetlands. The natural wetlands that went. Up. It's very complicated word wetlands. And so um, it had that natural wetlands there. So it was very predisposed to have a, a retention pond there. It made a lot of ten cents, and because of the the mass amount of erosion that was going north it probably made more sense to contain it there because that's the outlet to which all of the sediment and everything was going so i think that's why they flagged those lots for that does that help you mm -hmm. okay sorry i have more questions so then the lots so where you're looking at doing your retention pond those lots that are to the north of that what is your elevation buffer from flooding their basements to the retention. Good question. Uh, what do you want your basement with? Well, that's what you should. That's yeah, what I just let you know that my house happens to be one of the well, houses. Look so look right there, lot number two, that's bad. <laughs> that, that's me, so. He's acutely aware of the situation. Very aware of the situation. Uh, and that was part of the discussions in, in Friday where uh, the elevations uh, for the detention uh, on will be so that any negative impacting on adjacent lots won't have that. It will go over the, so just an example, yeah. the detention pond is basically a, a hole in the ground. It's got a pipe that reduces the amount of water that comes out based on a certain rate of flow. CFS. Yeah. Well, I was trying to just do it for everybody. Oh, sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, it's getting old. Can I simplify it? Can, yeah. can you just put that in? Can you shoot when you're using your GPS? Just shoot what their basement levels are at so that it gets documented so that there's a, a, a documented elevation buffer. So, with what you said, it, it won't go off the basements, it would go off the rear lot lines. Because it, if you're fine with that, no, no, but that's that, just that would just be what it's supposed to where your water so, entrance is. So is what so the detention pond it collects the water, it's got the pipe that reduces the rate, and then there's an overflow on it. Okay. Right. So then that elevation of that overflow is set at a level that the lowest point, which would be lot one actually, not not me, but pretty mm -hmm. close. So that that overflow would be able to take basically all the water that currently would come there now without it would be able to flow over that and go downstream in that significant event without affecting any of the north properties. Andy, there was another point of discussion here that I don't know if we covered on Friday, but between lots two and three, remember we said that you know sometimes you have to make changes after um, a development is created. So if you look between two lot lot two and lot three, there was an additional culvert put in there, and there's an outlet there at the corner between Ed and between Ospops, which is two and three. And so that would be the five or three five. It's the north two and three lots, not the south. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah, so right there. You will need to account for that in your design because there is water coming from Valley View to that location as well. That's that's what ISG and, and Banner are, cool. are working on. I just want to make sure everybody's yeah. aware of that. And when you talk about it going downstream, it's mm -hmm. going to cross fit. Yep. Underneath. 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 Right. Yeah. And come through the natural drainage that's there along the through the school. So the detention yep. pond slows it down, but you can never build one big enough for the hundred year flood point. Basically, is what it amounts to. So if you hit those points, the overflow allows water to come out faster to prevent property damage upstream and push it downstream at a faster rate, which is the rate that it would come right now without anything there. So it's designed to work most of the time. I mean, yeah, there's, there's usually a the, when you build, when you have the hole in the ground, you build a wall around it, like a berm, basically. And there's a pipe at a certain level, and once the water gets to that level, it goes out. That's pretty much what it does. It just slows the flow to a point where downstream can manage it, and upstream is not affected. 
So we wouldn't have the wash up that we had at the stadium. Correct. Right. Or right. At Lovely. Unless we had a hundred year event, and then that's something that you can't really. That you try to offset. You you can't you can't you can't plan for ten inches of rain in an hour and a half. I mean that's well, that's a act of nature. Act of nature. So. Where the concern there is, you talk about protecting the property owners upstream. Mm -hmm. it, it, it also protects it, it yeah. does so yeah. so, so it, it does because mm -hmm. like I said 99.9% .9 of the time because you're at 100 years it protects everybody it's just that mass event where it allows more water out at a faster rate and the reason why this is so critical too is because as you know we're going to be in high school and so it's important that they have expectations of what the water flows will be. And so it's important that we're responsible upstream so that way downstream people can plan and make sure that they have what they need for their plans. And then ultimately, <clears throat> this pond is at a functional rate as well. So everything plays on everything all the way to the right. And the subordinate property is then identified then for the Which subordinate? Any? Right. So this is this is my involvement with the Haha County, right? I was a subordinate account as a subordinate property to a development. So then, right, what happens is my insurance rates get notified and increased because I now the watershed has changed going to become my property. I don't know what happened when the development was originally designed and who was notified. I have no idea. Bob, were you guys notified as a downstream property? Subordinate owner? property just recently with Grant no, Park? No. That, yeah, I mean with the Grant Park development. No. Okay. That's a side note, but then that does need to get addressed in yeah. the city's ordinance. You, you can't change the downstream flow. I know, and that's the whole problem. I'll make a note. And, and I'll tell you what. So basically, we, that's why this detention pond is needed. Uh, yes, we have an issue with a fence dispute. We don't want to have homeowners threatening to sue the city. The city of Sioux Falls paid almost $2 million to 400 homeowners. In, in one incident, yeah. so that's just one months. incident. Yeah, so we, we, <laughs> this I is serious. Serious yeah. business. Got that noted. I okay. have a question. This yeah. is kind of a dumb question. But no. Okay, so <laughs> you haven't heard it yet. <laughs> okay, so you talk about how it's going behind fence house because of the the reeds and the rushes and stuff like that. It's a natural waterway. Mm -hmm. It was taken out at the school. How does that work then? Okay, so it's still at the school. That natural drainage way is school. Well, so that natural drainage way actually goes across Fifth Street and Culver. The rip wrapped area between Fifth Street and Bulldog Avenue is the natural drainage way. Yeah. And then it comes out Bulldog Avenue, runs down along between the football field and Bulldog Avenue to Murphy's Pond. Mm -hmm. And then from Murphy's Pond, it goes down through the old trailer court. Right. And then it and goes to down the river. Yeah, the river. to the river. But, so, okay, so what's stopping it? I mean, I know that's been pulled, but wasn't it the the, re the rushes and the cattails the and stuff like that that slowed the, the water it, it going would, down and now that's been taken out. Okay, so it Does would it, it yeah. would slow it down to an essence, but if there's that much water, they're just gonna lay them flat. It's not gonna affect anything. They'll just fall so flat. They their reeds are designed to fall flat. Oh. And also to answer your question, the DANR asked the same question to make sure that things were applied the right way. Yeah. So they asked the same question. Yeah. So that's part of the DANR list. Okay. So that's regulated by the state. So I think we're fairly covered on that. That no. the paperwork they proposed, they proposed a preliminary design that needs some tweaking, and they're working on getting the final design out as soon as possible so that it can get approved, so that it can get moved forward with as soon as possible. And all parties are working on that. Yep. So that there is one of the good faith deals that is in the sub agreement that is being put together to be accepted to that it will be done. Yep. And that that uh, detention on analysis covered one, two, and three. Yep. <clears throat> 
<laughs> and the lot depth number four, we don't need to go into that one again. We've already covered it. And then number five, we covered that as well. Because uh, that's the same response. Yep. Um, number six is pretty much the same thing that they're going to take yeah. over responsibility if yeah. something's blocked up with water upstream. Yep. Number seven, uh, the Murphy's Pond uh, uh, to be clean. Uh, DPC proposes to clean out the pond. Uh, um, and then repair of riprap. Um, uh, we'd like to hold off with that. Uh, um, but we can clean out Murphy's Pond um, uh, and Ensure that's uh, taken care of. Why are you saying it has to be done in the winter time? I don't understand that. Because the ground is so soft right now. It's so full of water. It's saturated with water. So you let the ground freeze. Excavators and whatever you're using can get in there a lot easier and just take it out. It makes less of a mess. And yeah. yeah it, does, it actually preserves the ground way better because they're, they're right in the frost. Oh. When was it done last year in the summer? It, it, it was an absolute mess. It, out of the road all it, the way it was not done when it should have been done. Yeah. It, okay. It, it was a good, it needed to be done, but it was not done when it should have been done. It should have been waited until the ground froze. So it's, it's, it's an item that will be done, and it's in the sub agreement. Um, it's in the sub uh, division agreement that they're producing that it will be done. Is and a it's, on that? we are gonna make them put a timeline in that as soon as the frost is stable enough, that it needs to be done. So again, you guys, you're going through this memorandum to make sure we're all on the same page, make sure that we're not missing anything. But then we still have to have the, um, the agreement. The agreement is a separate, the development agreement is a separate document which will probably require some more due diligence before we can go through that entirely. But getting through this memorandum to make sure you guys are all cool with it is definitely the first step of getting to that development agreement. And so uh, the number eight is seven and eight are pretty much the same. same. Repair the rip wrap because yep. it's got to be cleaned out and redone. Nine. And that was done in two stages. Didn't you yeah, and that, so by doing it in the winter time, you can do it all at one time. It's one mess, one shot, put it in, fix it, be done with it, and have it cleaned out. And aren't you going to wait until the school construction is done? Or you're gonna... no, no, because there's a technical difficulty there. That is a question they asked also. So the problem is, is the school is funded by the state and taxpayers. Okay, so if it waits until the school's done, well, first of all, it's on an immediate action item from the state of South Dakota, so technically, legally, it can't wait. But if it, the school, when theirs is done, when the erosion control is done properly, there should not be any thing into Murphy's Pond because obviously we've learned that we'll make sure that it's done properly and everything's up kept. So, with that being said then who decides who pays what portion of it? And then does that give the contractors at the school free reign not to worry about their sediment then because it's already gotta be cleaned out, so. So what about the discharge of Murphy Pond? Those then, I get onto Grant Capital property. Yep. My reservation, my concern is that other culvert after that before it goes to the and we can't look at that at present moment in time that's something that's got to be future looked at for the city of Baltimore. No, no he's I'm talking about the capacity, capacity. Right there, it so does flood right there so because you're taking now you're adding value and then the school is going to add because they're putting parking lot right. in which adds flow volume and, and everything true. else that's so yeah so to add that though the school is taking into consideration water flows are and they're doing the studies right Bob you're doing the studies to figure right. out any um, effects of water so if the city is covering any mitigating downstream from from Grant Park and Grant Park is doing their due diligence the school does their due diligence 
of what changes with the new high school, then that mitigates that. And then it, we've got Murphy's Pond doing what it's supposed to be doing after the stretch. So that, that way it has its full capacity again. Then it goes, then, then it should help. Right. It should help. Now, there's no question we have to look at that. But at least the steps we're all taking as a team, we're trying to help it. So then we're going to be like, Okay, now what do we do with this? But it, you got to start at the top. Right. And no, I just make sure that's in the story. Oh, yeah. well yeah. aware. Well aware. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. so Murphy's Pond, no more questions on that. It's going to no, be on the subcontractor agreement that as soon as the ground's frozen hard enough, it's going to get cleaned out and repaired. Number 9, 10, uh, and 11 um, uh, dealt with uh, cleanup. Uh, we've been uh, diligent in cleaning it up, and we realize it's going to be <coughs> monitored. And we'll be uh, doing due diligence to make sure that. Okay, there's some stuff that's got to be said on that briefly. Sure. Not going to make a big deal out of it. Sure. Um, Mr. City sent out a letter that really has a lot of things that were not verified to be true, because I can contest that. A statement that 73% of the people voted for um, this new school addition based on the growth of our town is a lie because I per se voted for that. So I'm part of that 73%. And I did not vote for that because our town's going to grow. I voted because we needed the school. Okay, so that's not true. Um, secondly, the deal with cleaning up the sediment on the school property. So the state's report, and I can send it to you too, states on there that it is to be cleaned up. So if the school does not allow Grant Park to clean it up, then that means the school is responsible to clean it up. And my taxpayer dollars are not going to clean it up. So we need to look at it as an example of who's going to clean up the sediment from Grant Park. Is the school that is state funded and tax funded by the citizens? going to pay to clean it up or is the development that caused the issue going to clean it up and i really do believe that the school board had the best of intentions in mind and that they were just asking us to stay in our lane and not directing a developer to do stuff on their land and it however, wasn't us however, however, yeah however, yeah let me yes. let me think yeah. so about it if i may I do think that there was misinformation in that it was a state requirement, not a city requirement to have that. The whole thing that we have an issue with is that requirements were made or that, why didn't somebody talk to us? So the state but then why did not talk to us? I mean, you're, you're asking them to, to, to do stuff on school property That's, and you never talk to us? No, no. So Let's, okay, so the state requires them to do it. They are required to talk to you. Not the state, not us. The developer that has the problem that is required to clean it up is the one that's responsible to talk to the school to, to get permission to do what they are required to do by the state. Is what I'm saying is if it doesn't get cleaned up by the developer, the state says it must be cleaned up. The state DNR has a lot of power. Okay, when it comes to this stuff. So if the school chooses not to let Grant Park clean up the mess, then that means it's on the school to clean it up because it has to be cleaned up because that ditch is not where it's supposed to be at no more. It is filled full of sediment. And yeah. so let me just finish real quick. So with that being <clears throat> said, I'm pretty sure <clears throat> that the taxpayers do not want to clean that mess up. That's where I'm coming from, okay? And that letter, I mean, same thing goes. Did you send that letter out in a public meeting to the whole entire public without talking to anybody with the city? No. Who did you talk to? Because the Planning and Zoning Council is referred to in the letter, and did you talk to anybody on Planning and Zoning and ask them any questions before that letter was sent no. out and discussed in a public meeting? It was not disclosed in a public meeting it was at the school board meeting the letter was not no but, the, but the, what you just said is the letter okay so yeah. the letter wasn't but the issues were and then the letter was sent out after the fact you're right okay so and that that letter predated a 
lot of things that have happened since it then. did okay it did but keep that in mind if i sent you that letter how would you feel right now i also think that it's important so let's keep our eye on the ball Okay, right? I, I just want to make this short, well, point that well, out. I'm, that No, I'm going to step into this conversation because you know what we don't want? The city doesn't want to have a, a, a rhetorical conversation with the school. That's not what this is about. The school is here for the best interest of the school district. The city is here for the best interest of the taxpayers. And so the city has always taken the stance that we trust the school we trust the administration, we trust the board, we believe that you're doing exactly what you need to do with your due diligence for what is best for the school district. And we just ask that the school also gives us that same confidence that we are doing what we're supposed to do on our side. And I think the, the fastest and easiest way to put this to bed is that we all agree that if there's a question and we feel that there's an overstepping, that the conversation happens first. Bob has expressed that he feels that the city made a statement that encroached on the school and then the school responded by making a statement that the city felt that they encroached on us. So none of us want this relationship. None of us want this dynamic. Can we all agree on that? Absolutely. Perfect. So what we, what we need to realize here is that the city is doing everything they can within the realm of their fiduciary responsibility to ensure that this development is in the best interest of all the taxpayers and there is no undue cost to taxpayers because of oversight, lack, whatever it is, pushing through, whatever you want to call it, we have to do this. When we wrote, when we wrote this agreement, it was based on the state requirements and I need you all to understand there was no intent on forcing action on the school in any way. Just like when um, citizens came to complain about the erosion control, we referred the citizens to talk to the developer and the developer handled it and the city was hands off. This was merely the accountability statement between the city and the developer that they will do, the do, they will do their responsibility to contact the school and take care of that land. It wasn't that we were stepping in saying you have to do this. They were well aware of their responsibility to contact you about that downstream flow. They were well aware of it. And this is just articulating and confirming that they will see that through. That's all it was. And if there was a misunderstanding about that, then there should have been a conversation between the school administration and the board with the PNZ and the council and the city employees. And so when that didn't happen, that was the initial breakdown. The statements about the building permits was just lack of due diligence and lack of communication. Nobody, nobody appreciated either side of this, it's apparent, but we need to move forward. However, the difference is, is I don't feel we made a public statement as a city that put the school in a bad light. I do believe the statement that the school board made put the city in a bad light. So I think right now where we are is we believe that the school board needs to make a corrective statement because you didn't know how much work what was happening. Things have happened post your letter, but Bob, there was a lot happening before your letter that you simply weren't privy to because you weren't part of those conversations. I'm not gonna fault you for that, but it's true. So even though I believe your intentions were pure, they were misled and ill-timed. So I do believe the school board does owe a retraction statement to the city because you simply didn't know what you didn't know. That's my honest opinion of the situation. I think they, I think she made she made my point that it, that it was. I guess my point, you know, just like you said, you know, the school boards. You Are know, you Chris, on the school board? Yes, I okay. am Chris Wild. Chris, okay, and Pam And, 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 and yeah, you know, I know Pam. And welcome. So. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So yeah, that was basically, you know, we felt that we needed to discuss this in the board meeting because we need to figure out, what, you know, a way forward. What do we do with what this, you know? What should we do when when yeah. the city was telling a contractor to come do work on our property without our knowledge, our approval? That's that's my perspective. So that's why we Thing, discussed real it. quick before you go on. Has have they approached you to this date about coming on school property to clean that up? Asking permission? Yes. No. Okay. So okay. 
that that's all we needed to know because that's a crucial thing right there for this whole agreement moving forward. So, we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, yeah. but you, you see where we're coming from, and, and I hope you see where we're coming we do. from. That, we do, we do. If I was a you know, if I if, if somebody told my neighbor to come, you know, bring an excavator on my property, I feel the same way the school did, right? So, that's, that's our perspective, and I think. The other thing that I might add is that has there been a discussion? That's why we're here tonight. Do you understand that? I sent the letter only to you and to the city council members. Yeah, only to you so to give you a heads up about why we were coming tonight. Okay. Does that, does that make and sense? So and I thought that was a courtesy to you. Um, now I guess next time maybe I learned the lesson. We'll just show up. So. My perspective, okay. Nobody's seen the letter except us. We've all read it. We've seen it, okay. So it was posted. It was posted it was online. Posted it was so the posted by obligated to do it has to be posted by the city because it was sent to the city of public knowledge. So everybody in town has read the letter. That, no, not everybody. That wants everybody to go on and read it. It's, it's, it's available. It's available. So with that being said, I mean, there's comments in there about being anti-development anti-growth um, okay i make my living off of growth and development for 30 years i put developments in i repair roads that's what i do for a living so being anti-growth and anti-development not true but being well, not held, true in your opinion yes can, can i state that yes not true in your opinion okay and i, I really if, if i can say one other thing i'm not sure this we have always, I think, the school, when I say we, the school has always had a good working relationship with the city. And I hope you feel that way too. We want that. Okay? We, and everybody wants, wants that, that to continue. We do. Everybody wants that. And I guess I would like to have a constructive conversation that doesn't harm that relationship right now. Yeah. In all honesty, I don't see this conversation going that way. We're just going back and forth. So, yeah, so, right so the yeah. conversation is done, okay? Grant Park needs to contact you guys, and he, Andy's here, so he will talk. Yeah. Cool. We'll so, but with that being said, as towards Grant Park, that letter from the state was sent to him in June, and they to this date have not even contacted the school about cleaning up that mess. So with that being said, when we suspended the building permits because they're not doing what they were required to do, with the school not knowing that they had been told that they needed to clean this up, so the school should have already been contacted by the developer. So the school shouldn't have been surprised when they seen that because they should have already known from the developer that there was a problem. And that they were required to clean it up by the hey, state. Hey, Ed. Yep. Uh, very, very second here, I, and, I, and I, I don't want to butt in, but I also, uh, you know, don't want this development to be a cause for a rift between the city and the school. Yep. Um, you know, we, we understand that in, if we go backwards in time and we litigate what's happened before, we're not going to get out of here tonight or, or maybe ever. No, we'll get out of here real soon. And, and we understand that, that it's, you know, that. We undertook after our conversation on Friday to go forward with the school and say that we will clean up that if, if they will let us. And, yep. you know, I, I guess I'm assuming they will, and it'll be part of the project that cleans out Murphy's Pond when, when the, the ground frosts over. So if, if that helps move this forward, we, we understand that that's, that's how we do that. That's what we will do. That is part of, you know, our development agreement to, to do that. The school can take whatever stance the school wants to take, and obviously that's going to be be there in their court. But I, I would imagine that they're going to allow us to to clean it up and and put everything back in place. But um, I, I don't know that we can go any further than that right here in order to get all this done. No, I agree with you 100. percent And the only reason why I was bringing it up with the school not knowing because the development hadn't done it is because that is a major factor in any decisions that are made based on 
them doing what and, they were and supposed I, I to do. I just want to represent that we understand that and we, yeah. we are doing it and we, and we came to that conclusion with everybody on Friday. So. Yeah, well, but so everybody on Friday, but the people didn't, everybody sitting here didn't get all that out of it, if that makes any sense. So that's no, why I, it was I, I appreciate right. you clarifying that. I really okay. So we're good. That's it. So Barry, basically, what he's saying is nobody in this room knew that the school didn't know. We were all under the assumption that the developer had already contacted the school. And I know. So I, I, I think understand that. Was part I understand of the that. And, that, and that's why it was very helpful to have that clarity. I appreciate it. Definitely. So the other, just the other thing that I might add, we're still looking at our construction plans. So for them, to, and it could involve that ditch. So for them to come in and do any work right now would be might be premature. Might, might. You know what I mean? So I just need to make that point too. So uh, and I agree with you there, but the same problem is though that ditch had an elevation at it, and that elevation is crucial. And ISG represent. I can't remember. Ari. 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 Yes, sir. So he can stand to this too. So. That ditch had a set elevation in it, and that set elevation is no longer there, okay, because it's been filled in with silt. So that affects way too many things to wait because you are still in construction phases. And that goes back to them with the waiting on cleaning out Murphy's Pond, you know. So it's all that same factor that the capacity is not there, if that makes any sense. So that's why it's a crucial thing, and that's why the state put it on the report that it had to be put back. I understand. Let us work it out. Okay. With that. All right. Perfect. One thing I'd like to say before to you out. move on, okay, as somebody who I only have one dog in this fight, and that's that I'm a taxpayer. I'm not on the school board. I'm not on the council. I'm not on PNC. I just live in this community, and I think all of us live here for the right reason. We like our community, we love our school, we want what's best for the community, and I think we all will agree communication is going to be key. And the one thing everybody in this room needs to take away from this meeting tonight is communication is key. Reasonable people will differ. It's how we handle those differences. And I, what I'm hearing both ways is nobody wants what's happened to this point to damage that relationship. And I think that is very good for our community, for our kids in school. Well, yeah, we, we all have kids for in everyone. school here. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we either all have or have kids in school here. I had to ask, I talked to you how old your kid was. <laughs> but I mean, and she's right. I moved here six and a half years ago for the school. I mean, that's the reason I moved here and chose to become a resident of Baltimore. So just, just to let everybody know that I'm not anti-school or anything of the sort. So, but that's solved. They'll contact you guys now, so you're aware of what's going on and everything. Well, we're almost there. Yeah, the remaining. Or we've already covered them all in Phillips Crossing with the testing and the fire hydrant exactly. issues. Yep. And there's no, well, the, the manhole, uh, the manhole the settlement asphalt uh, at Fifth Street. We're planning on giving an action prior, yeah. plan of action prior to the end of the year. Okay, so if anybody knows that manhole at Fifth Street, they're the from the trenching that's settled, there's a dip there, it holds water in it and everything. They're going to mill, mill it out, overlay it with asphalt, so everything's good. So now, the only thing we have left to do is the quiet, please. Um, the agreement. So the development agreement. Um, a lot of. Hey, can I just interject something? Yeah. Um, are you going to restate that letter at all, or at least correct the record of it, since it was a formal statement from the? Is that an official request from the the city council or the planning and zoning? It's just a question. Um, because if if it becomes an official request, then our board will consider it. That's good. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Bob. And we'll be in touch. Okay, so so this development agreement we created, uh, there's 
there's legalese in there, so I'm, I, I, I want to uh, get to Article 1, uh, and that's the covenants that are being promised by the developer and, and, and the city. Um, we covered them all in that memo that we just uh, addressed, so that's the good portion. Um, I don't really know if it's a bad portion for this. Um, but it uh, states the detention pond, where it would be located, uh, the payment to, is done by the developer, the risk uh, during the construction uh, held by the developer, installation of the 7th Street towards Lovely, and it has in there um, the flexibility to have this discussion on what that would be and this discussion should not negate the void or any uh, hold anything collateral to the other covenants in this agreement. And I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I'm sorry. Um, I just thought of something. The, the, nothing was mentioned about the detention pond on the south end. Is that supposed to be in here at all? Or that's not in this because that's a separate issue okay. with yep. with that land going okay. that. Because it wasn't in the memorandum. That that's the reason why. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the only thing yeah. in the memorandum about that is cleaning it out and that falls underneath the okay. the sewer lines and stuff before it turns over to the city. Okay. Please continue. Can I go um, one other thing that maybe is like the detention plan that I just have a question about? Um, so when I heard you guys talking back and forth, when I listened to, you know, you guys, what about the um, the water going into these two additions? Is there enough water being pumped in there? Because it's a real concern. You're right? you're talking the the drinking water, the the yes. city water main. Well, and I, I want to know that if there's a fire, that because right now you didn't have that information. It's in this. It's in here. And this, is, uh, this report is uh, excerpts <coughs> from a larger water study that the city of Baltic had done last year, uh, October, something like that. Something yeah. like that. And Banner had uh, taken out the relatively uh, uh, relevant parts to uh, what that. Uh, water study uh, stated, and the reason for this water study was for the um, application for the water study plan uh, to get funding for the, uh, the water projects uh, to close the loop. And this study says with Grand Park and Phillips Crossing uh, additions filled <coughs> out, the existing water uh, system has adequate capacity to maintain it. I just want the record to show that ISG has not had a chance to review that. They yet. have not. Yep. We yep. received it at 3.20 this afternoon. Um, so no, so, no time was given to us to so review this as a meeting. With that being said, the report to answer Deb's question does not tell you anywhere in it if at the top of that development, there is enough water pressure or volume to put out a fire with the fire department. It refers to the whole town to do with the water tower and the water coming into the town. It does not, it does not answer her question because nobody has gone, I mean, the only way you could really answer that right now is we wanna take a full test and pressure test at the very top end because at the bottom where I live at Valley View, which is the bottom of the hill, if I open four faucets in my house, there is no fifth one because there's no water. Because everything is fed through one pipe at 6th and Lovely into Valley View addition. And now this new addition taps off that single pipe and runs up and feeds that. And there's almost 50 feet of incline, if I remember right, from the bottom to the top. So that means that water that I'm at the bottom can't open five faucets in my house. It has to push up 50 more feet to the top of the hill. So that's where Deb's coming from with the question on if the houses continue to be built, 
is there actually the fire protection at the fire hydrants to be able to handle a fire? Well, and for the homeowners too. Because yes. We have city hall every day saying our <laughs> yeah. We have no water. But, and Mary, you can jump in here. Yeah, yeah it, it's our understanding from a conversation with Banner at the end of the day, and, and they haven't produced this yet, that, that basically the current uh, hydrant pressures that are, are available would continue to be available with the new development and that's what their study will show now you know whether the current um pressures are are uh adequate for fire protection um you know they'll address that as well and i, and I think that was part of the study that was done last year and why the grants were were successfully applied for to to close the loop um, but what, what they indicated to us is that it wouldn't affect the level of fire protection by adding the, the new developments. And so, again, we'll get that over to ISG and they, and they can look at it. But that was my understanding from uh, our conversations at the end of the day. You, you are right there, except for when ISG looks at it, they'll see that they didn't figure the distance of the pipe with the elevation changes and stuff to hit that top of that development. So, but that's one of the concerns and one of the reasons why we got to the point we were at too, so. Sure, yeah, you know, I, I guess everybody knows we need to improve the water system. Um, and, you know, that's why all the work has been done to, to get there and, uh, you know, Certainly, Grant Park uh, understands that that's what's the future, but that's not something we can do something about right now. Okay, so are we good on that for now until I ask you Barry, that's time to. I just want you to understand though, if Banner cannot produce a report that provides adequate pressure for both fire hydrants and houses in that development. There will be further discussion between our two parties to figure out what the solution is because I, I, we, I do understand that. Okay, and I, I guess sure. what they represented to me at the end of the day is they can produce that report. So I, I guess I'm hoping that they're that's that's right. But if it's not, I understand that we've got a different situation. Okay. Thank you. So that one's solved. And so oh. yeah, and then uh, I I wanna note that you guys have said another drainage easement. On um, letter I in section in Article One, uh, we'll put that in there. Um, uh, well, well, first before I say we'll put it in there, we'll give it to Banner and do the proper way. Yep. yep. And then we'll have uh, if we need more discussion on that, we'll I'll, we can give you a call. Yep. Um, and then in uh, section one point uh, one two, it's the city uh, agrees with the developer. Um, to have the building permits released and then the available variances uh, be given to be reasonable variances. I think. So, um, and then we would work forward um, and not work in the past and lean forward to get uh, <coughs> profit to the right place for these developments. The extra provisions in here um, is the legal ease. Um, if John, if you don't mind me just summarizing them, yeah, um, sure. Uh, our mind, mind, I haven't I got a 3 20 p.m. this afternoon, too. Yeah, uh, um, Article 2 is identifying uh, each party to make sure that uh, we have that. Article 3 is the sign and transfer in case the owner of Grant Park, let's say, he, he passes. Died. We want something in there to ensure that it's not going to uh, some individual that's not qualified or a, uh, not a corporation, LLC, or developer. Per se. I think he should have to ensure that he lives. We want Brian to be okay. Mayor, I am a lawyer. I am not a magician. So, uh, uh, so Article 4 is um, if one party uh, uh, doesn't live up to the agreement, what that looks like, the uh, defaults and remedies. Article 5 lays out uh, the 
duration of the, the agreement um, when early termination is plausible um, and timelines to get that done. Uh, and then miscellaneous uh, provisions in Article uh, 6 gives the miscellaneous things to the agreement governing law make sure this is the entire agreement any other negotiations whatever outside of this uh, no matter it's in here um, where to send notices and the like the only thing that i can't um that i can recall that we really discussed tonight is the back side lots of fifth street for the sidewalk ordinance as we stated before it's not the front lot, it's the back lot. It's the developer's uh, boulevard responsibility to have sidewalks and curb and gutter on that back side of those lots. So again, we have a safe walkway to the school. That's the only thing that we haven't covered yet tonight. And that also falls in with Elizabeth where it comes on to Fifth Street with the curb and gutters wrapping around the corners and and stuff and especially the detention pond that sidewalk lot that you've put in obviously yeah. with the ada's there along that property but sure. that's that's stuff that's kind of pretty much covered in here but not yeah. spelled out sure it should probably be 100 percent. so it needs to be changed just slightly there and if you guys can send send us we'll go through yeah 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 just giving you a heads up so that's Absolutely. just a couple minor and we'll Convey it. Yeah, I, I guess this, this would be my suggestion too that we get this we get this agreement done and with the understanding that we may need to amend it in the future for, for additional and it's, it's actually in the agreement that it says that too that it can be amended. And, and that's yeah. another thing I want to point out. Uh, it's binding, uh, but it can be amended with both parties consenting to the, the change. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the other the other hope that we have for the city is that now they've got a template to to for future developments. That, you know, th this is a precedent that's been set that you you need a development agreement. And you know, again, we don't want to look backwards, but arguably this would have been a pretty valuable thing to have. Uh, it have a lot. Of and it should have been. Get all this done. Yeah. So, and you guys know the drafters. So. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's all to end this night we need to have a motion made to accept the agreement and reestablish billing permits under the terms of the agreement that everything's going to be done in a timely manner pending, um, pending. pending. Yep. Uh, I, I would I haven't even had a chance to say no been. so but we is all we can do is so you haven't had a chance to study it yet, so but as because we're the ones that we so we need a motion to table the agreement, but we also need to look at if we are going to table until we have time to look at this and then possibly have a special appeal, or if we're going to reinstate billing permits based on this being acceptable. Well, and may I add, uh, I mean, we're willing to keep working on this uh, in uh, I mean, both parties in good faith with everything uh, that, um, that uh, I guess we ask, even if uh, we, we haven't had the time to finalize the agreement to work forward with uh, um, the recommendation to state building permits is, I guess, what I... I would ask. So, Ed, something to consider. Um, because the the bulk of what we're looking at for this is really the north flowing properties that require the detention pond and all the space. For all practical purposes, the south flowing properties have met the majority of our requirements, correct? And the ones on Phillips Crossing. And the one, well, there's still some stuff on Phillips Crossing, but yes, for all the practical purposes, those are much smaller issues and do not create uh, pain for downstream people. So one thing to consider for you guys to consider is potentially 
allowing building permits on those north flowing properties and allowing growth building permits back in Village Crossing, but still holding off on the south flowing, or excuse me, north flowing. Did I say, did I mess that all up? Sorry, I messed it all up. So the, the south flowing properties that are basically under control, the Phillips Crossing properties that are under control, it, it might be worth a conversation whether or not you want to grant building permits for those sections. There's one problem with that. The south flowing ones, there's issues with that. That is a separate case that's not discussed here. Okay. So if we allow those to be reinstated without the other ones being reinstated, then that causes, puts the city, what you say, John, because of the Simmonsma property with that tension pond, if we only instate those ones. Is that matter still in play? I yeah. don't, I haven't heard if it is yeah. or not, but. Anything from the paper. So we probably need verification that that has been put to bed for the South Point properties, Be but, but that still leaves Phillips Crossing so, to be open. So is what I'm, I guess is where I'm looking at it is if, so, if it's not put to bed or if it's kind of put to bed, if we allow building permits on the ones that dump water into him mm -hmm. and not the ones to the north, then that puts us in a bad situation. Um, as and also, I'm sorry, also the Dev's point, we need that report to show that we can handle building at all. We need to have the verification of what can be built in the maximum load of that single input. So we need that information too. So that's pretty critical for you guys to make an educated decision. That was huge. Yes. So let's go with a motion to temporarily table. Yeah, it's just to table until we can get the information. Until we get the the hydrant report for safety for fire hydrants for more houses to go in up there. And as soon as that's in, we can have a special session to reinstate after we get this we'll, we'll see we'll see what the analysis yes brings. Mm -hmm. yes and i think that's good you guys because there's still some <laughs> steps we have to evaluate and still need recommendations from the engineers bless you but so i think i think phillips crossing down on the low end would be do we have any pressure concerns though no high. They're, they're what? They're all, they're all tied together. Oh, they are. Oh, there yeah, go. that's right, because they don't have water running down lovely, so it yeah. comes up through there and then back down to Phillips Cross. So we're going to need that report, Andy. Well, and I just want to kind of point out, too, the uh, manor had uh, given the uh, timetable of when those uh, uh, pipes would be connected with the award, the grant funds, and everything that uh, the city had gotten. And so if uh, there was any concern, it should be mitigated by that timeline. What was the timeline? Just so everybody it, knows. Yeah, it's, it's in the... Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm just having you say for the people in the audience listening. So I guess, so when you look at the report here, one real quick thing is 5.3.2. Two, two, okay, it says existing system pressure. During their base scenario, the system pressure range from 35 to 90 PSI. It is recommended that pressure of the system be above 20 PSI at any location by this standard, okay? By this system, it is sufficient, okay? But none of that was in to test when this was done. So this is a real simple analysis that they can do is all it is is a matter of going, putting a gauge in a flow deal meter on the fire hydrant up at the top and see if it meets the requirements from the state for fire protection. I mean, it, it takes, I don't know if the Baltic Fire Department does, but the Sioux Falls Fire Department has the stuff themselves to check the flows on fire hydrants. And silly question from somebody who knows virtually nothing about that. Does it make a difference the time of day when that pressure is checked? Because I know my water pressure at home varies depending upon if it's during the school day, if it's at supper time when everybody's home. Nate would know that. It is 
you got your peak demand with everybody using the water, you're going to have a little less because your higher elevation is not going to get the water it needs because your pressure is going to be at the lower elevations. So, yeah, to try that, the best time to do that if you want to do it on peak would be dinner time. Yep. Yeah, be right around you when the restaurants using and everybody oh, is yeah. eating. Then you know your worst case scenario is covered. In so is your worst case sufficient. in the evening then or at lunch? Or is that lunch, 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 lunch. Lunch. Pay attention. <laughs> because everybody eats dinner at different times and all that stuff. Lunch at the school, they use all the water and everything is right there. And uh, you just wanted to point out uh, that the uh, excerpts from the bigger study, um, the highlights of what the study had said, saying yep. that um, the existing system uh, is not impacted because it has the capability to uh, bring the pressure as it does anywhere else in Baltic to the new additions. Any problems that the city of Baltic has right now will be uh, at that uh, point in time. Yes. Point, so. But because then you see, you all understand those are Biden bucks and they're not even going to be accessible to us until 2024. So the point of concern was what do we do from now to then? So that's why we need to know what the existing structure can handle today. Because I know at my house, when I put my sprinkler system in for my lawn, they test it water pressure because they can only put so many heads on and whatnot. So I live at the bottom, basically, pretty much. Right. And my pressure is only 40 PSI. But your pressure is going to depend on when your chest test it, yep. how full that water tower is. Right, exactly. When your water tower is only half full, you ain't going to have enough pressure. So with that being said, we're going up 50 more feet elevation through a six inch line that's gonna have more people on it, more. And the, so, to speak to that, um, talking with Banner and um, him, layman's terms of the, the study, the, the bigger study and this, um, and uh, summarizing it, it says that Grant Park addition and Phillips Crossing addition filled out will not have negative impacts on the city's pressure, nor if it's looped, it says. Once it's looped. With or without, no, ex existing. And it says that with looped as well. Did you see that piece there? Well, so when you read the so the distribution improvement sections. Section 6.2.4. So it says during, so page page five, existing uh, system pressure. Yeah. During the base scenario, the system pressure is ranged from 35 to 90 PSI. Recommended pressure systems be above 20 PSI in any location. So by the standard, the pressures in the Baltic system are sufficient, and that's including the. So, I, 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 that's what I was looking for earlier. Ed's saying if, if that development is 50 foot higher, from where he's at to there, he lost 21.3 psi. So, is where I'm getting at is the bottom has yellow. The top of the hill has green dots. So how is there more pressure at the top of the hill than the bottom of the hill? If that makes any sense. I mean, because it says right there. Um, um, Blue is less than 40. They kind of got their color. So it says... Um, Yellow dots between 50 and 60, green dots between 40 and 50. So that's so that's 10. But I live at one of the yellow dots, and I don't got, never have had 60 to 70 psi at my house. So, Barry, can you? Uh, uh, I'm colorblind. These dots are not helping me. <laughs> yes. um, so. If, if you can uh, speak up. Well, you know, I, I, I guess 
obviously I, I'm not a, a water engineer um, and, and I, I don't want to guess on these, but I, I certainly understand what you're saying, Ed. Um, and you know, you know what the PSI in your own house is. Um, I, I guess what I would suggest is, you know, this is obviously going to be an outstanding issue at the end of this meeting. We're not going to resolve it right, right. now. Um, so why, why don't we go ahead and let Banner issue what they talked about with us this afternoon and let them on the ISG talk about, you know, that results and if that settles things or if it doesn't, you know, as we indicated earlier, we're going to have to come back and talk about it some more. Um, I, I think that the main concern of, of our clients is, you know, if we're going to, I mean, he feels very strongly and, and I, I don't think there's opposition necessarily uh, from the city or anybody else that to actually get some lots built this this fall is an important view of progress of this of, of this development um, you know that shows that we're working together and getting that done and obviously there is a time uh, element to that because it's going to get colder and it's going to freeze and we're not going to be able to get in the ground after some period of time so um, if we can uh, you know, agree that we're going to come, you're going to review the information provided tonight. We're going to review the development agreement. We're going to get further uh, communication from Banner on the water study. Um, and then we will have uh, a special meeting as soon as practical to, to hopefully lift a, a ban on, on the building permits. And obviously that could be a limited lift. Um, Andy, do we have the specific lots that we're looking for as far as building permits? Not, not with me, no. We okay, that, but we, we know what they are, and maybe maybe having those in front of us too might help to say that these are the ones that are kind of ready to ready to dig. Um, and you know, some of those may be more appealing to the city than others. And if that's the case, then you know, maybe we can approve a couple of those and continue to move forward to show good faith on both sides. I think that'll help. ISG make an educated discussion with the city about kind of limitations that we have developed here in the report and memo as to what you were saying, Mayor, about releasing particular lots based on the criteria that, that's listed on the memo. And maybe Andy, you and Barry can provide that list of lots that you have in mind. Um, and you know, Barry, just for the benefit of those listening and those here, uh, we started in earnest in this process in July. The original memo from ISG was dated August 4. There were discussions and a formal response on uh, August 17. And then we've had revisions circulated on August 29, September 22, September 23, and then today, September 28. So I, uh, we appreciate uh, your work, both of you and Barry and Andy, and you I'll, can, I'll, give, I'll give most of the credit to Andy. Andy well, is, uh, and, is a hard-working kid, I'll tell you that. And much. ISG has been tremendous in uh, meeting us where we have had to uh, play catch-up. But you can see that the full attention of the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council is engaged on this project. So yes, we're all here. Absolutely. We're willing to spend, you know, three, four hours at a meeting and we'll keep this moving. We just need uh, to keep the pace, and and we'll we'll get it we'll get it going. Well, and you understand, John. On our side, obviously, we need to report to our client that we're 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 almost there, and uh, I hope that we are. Obviously, we still have some things to, to finish up, but I, I I feel very confident that we've got a framework that will allow us to, to move forward. And and I think if nothing else, we've certainly accomplished that tonight. So do you need a motion to the table? Do you need a motion to the table or a motion to... Do you need a motion or not? You, you really you don't need, don't any, need any, any official motion. motion. You, you can take uh, no action pending the understanding you all have. Yeah, uh, other, really, other than a motion to adjourn when you deem it appropriate, that would, there, there's okay. no other official action. So is what we're going to do is we're going to take no action tonight we are going to take a case-by-case -case look at 
what is provided for specific lots once the information is given to the city to make the best guess if there's impact or not on those particular lots to anything that is in the agreement, the the um, the memos, the memorandum to see if we can proceed with building permits on um, case by case. And I guess uh, to to just illustrate uh, in action uh, the good faith of this meeting. Is there any lots that we can agree on right now? We well without knowing which lots want them. I mean, we. I mean, that can get done. Need the water report yes. Oh, yeah. And I mean, they can get that water report in a day. I mean, it doesn't take much. So, my recommendation is to have them get that water report from the hydrants up in the new addition, so that we have actual numbers from there. And like I said, it doesn't take any time to get that. And a list of the lots where people want to build at. And then we can have a special meeting once that is provided to reinstate building permits. Yeah, it makes necessary. sense to have spot checks um, pressured throughout because there's houses there now. Is, does it make sense to spot check that? What, is, what would you be your recommendation from a water standpoint? Whatever you have for pressure at your highest point hydrant is is pretty much what you're going to have you're not going to have a whole lot of change in that development your highest point hydrant if you end up with 40 psi that's pretty much what you're going to get is 40 psi and if it's 30 psi it's 30 yeah. and vice versa so i mean you may change there's, there's no use checking downstream because what you have at the highest point is going to be what you're going to have for Pressure up there. Uh, the highest point in here. Yeah. So, and if we get those, this the arbitrarily saying when we would get those, not saying that we are getting those, but for timeline purposes, if we got those tomorrow, when could we have the, the special? As session? soon as we have the information, we'll, the city will reach out to everybody. We'll get a date. We'll get a time we'll let you know. We we have to have it's forty eight hours minimum, right? Twenty four hours. Twenty four. So twenty four hours minimum. And Ed, I know there's not a hard cast date, but obviously there's a, a date that we're not going to dig. Um, you know, so I, I, I assume October is getting about as late as you want to get. So, yes, well, no, windows, not true. Windows closing. They, you can dig year round. It just takes a little more work, but sure, uh, sure, sure. But as far as the ground.